Are we one final test? And man, that's, that's uncomfortably loud to talk this loud. Testing, testing. Yes, it is. It is a little bit uncomfortable. But if I talk to that goat there instead, that's oh, kind of yeah. That's kind of better ish. Talk to talk to the butterfly next to it, maybe. Yeah. But you're not actually talking to the butterfly. You're commenting on you're talking to the butterfly. So I'm you're talking, talking about your, the butterfly. You are to yourself. Yeah. Instead of to the butterfly. Oh, <laughs> uh, damn it. Look at how loud I am on this damn chart. <laughs> <sighs> levels, levels. This is something we struggle with. It's probably our intro. Okay. Um, welcome to Radio Free Golgotha. The Feast of St. Peter and St. Paul, June 29th. Uh, Hello! That was almost loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> the butterfly's a little bit closer. Yes! Uh, yes, it is! Yes! I'm trying to be louder. Levels are uh, a problem for us, as we've just said. Uh, hello! Uh, welcome to the episode, which, as Jesse's just wonderfully introduced, is the Feast of <laughs> Peter and Paul. Shade right there. <laughs> Never, never. Uh, this uh, week, uh, it, uh, our episode is brought to you by Peter and Paul, uh, a double A side of Saints, a double Saint side, if you will, uh, as well as the Herb Basil, the Stone Sapphire, the Magic of Magic Swords, the Geomantic Figure of Pua, and its attendant, uh, Irete, mm -hmm. Irete, uh, Odu. Uh, the Hierophant tarot card, the Major Arcana of the, the Hierophant, as you probably say, the dead magician Honorius, uh, such as he is, such as he is, the Devil Sergothi, and the Eshu Mirim. So, where would you like to start, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> um, in saying, you know. I'll have to remember it. It'll be this is eventually a footnote thing. What is the damn chaos magic? The Oranian barbaric for morning is not the magician's friend. <laughs> it's one of my favorite. War <laughs> Used to be tattooed all over everything, but because Oranian barbaric is a stream of syllable of consonants, and right, right. It's very hard to remember the damn words, mm -hmm. um, which is probably good for magical reasons. <laughs> uh, okay. We had a successful lecture last night, and so it, uh, out later than I'm used to being out in my hermitish uh, enclave. So uh, bringing it back to the, the, the pillars of the church seems to be a wonderful way to recover. So Peter and Paul, uh, start there. We might as well and, and see where we go from there. Um, I always feel like talking about the saints first is is an easy out in a, in a good way. Yeah. Um, so Peter and Paul, their feast day is together. It's this Friday, June 29th. Uh, which hopefully you are hearing this on that day or later. Um, but uh, Peter, I think, is the easier one for people to, to remember who he is because he, he, he knew Jesus in his lifetime. He and his brother uh, were both apostles, and Peter is famous for being the, the rockhead upon which Jesus built his church. Um, and I'm fascinated with Peter for both the, the, the Catholic, the folk Catholic upbringing side of things, but also his, his role in many uh, modern streams of traditional witchcraft as uh, because of his prominence as a Catholic figure, because the church is built literally upon his bones and the authority of the earthly church comes from him uh, and justified because of his story of inheriting the keys. I, Peter becomes an interesting figure for me. Um, he, uh, his original name, yes, was Simon, and because of possible humorous reasons, Jesus names him Rock, um, uh, Kephas, and, and which gets translated into Greek as Petras, and becomes, uh, he's the rock upon which he builds his church, he's the, and there is, a uh, evidence that it is a slander, that it is a, uh, you are a bonehead. You, oh, get, yeah? you take things too literally. You blockhead. A blockhead, exactly. Ah. Um, at least this is what our loving Franciscan uh, uh, biblical literature teacher told us many times. And Peter does seem to be someone who takes things very literally and genuinely loves Jesus in the Gospels. Um, and ultimately is also, I think, part of the thing that we remember Peter for is his betrayal of Jesus uh, in small in the small denials that happened around the crucifixion. Right. So during a pressured time, he's asked, "Do you know that man?" And he has to say, "I don't know him," which is saving his himself. 
Um, and consequently later on it says that he loves Jesus three times, which seems to make up for it. Uh, it, it said to make up for it in this kind of way we study the text as a, as a lovely novel. Hmm. Um, but I think the thing with, with Peter that's interesting, in contrast to Paul, uh, Peter knew the physical Jesus. Paul never knew the physical Jesus. Paul was a persecutor of Christians, Saul of Tarsus, uh, who was on the road, saw Jesus come in a blinding light, and Jesus says, why do you persecute me? And, and Saul slash Paul converts to Christianity and becomes a, a pillar of the church. So you get the 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 sword, the defense of the sword. And, and Paul, which is interesting there because Paul is emphasizing the spirit of Christ and Peter is emphasizing the humanity of Christ. So you get this interesting parallel with the two natures, which ties right. into Honorius, interestingly. Hmm. Um, the historical Honorius, not necessarily the Honorius, the magician that, we, that wrote the grimoire, which is actually what we're referencing. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I find that interesting that, that, that Paul is, in essence, a Gnostic. He never knew the physical Christ. He was not emphasizing the physical Christ. He was right. emphasizing the spirit of Christ and what that meant. And he wrote letters, that, and he's, uh, you know, a, a, a misogynist and, and many other things. Uh, we can excuse it from historical relevancy and time period, but at the same time, like, those are the verses that are used to subjugate people. Um, Slaves be obedient to your masters, and women be obedient to your husbands. Mm. Um Inferiors obey superiors. Right? Yeah, the, yeah. The foundation of, of, of hierarchy, of of versions of elite astrology, as Patrick Curry calls it, of uh, explaining how the universe works from a top-down emanationist model. Golden chain. Right, right. Um, which still is embedded in our cosmology. And, and it's it's so, like any proper cultural phenomenon, that is the people that are in the culture don't quite know that it's in the that it's there. Until it's identified, it's um, a word for water. Yeah, exactly. What are the fish saying? Um, so I, I'm interested in <clears throat> the the relationship with truth here. That Peter denies something that he knows because it saves his own ass. Yeah, and that's fascinating, right? Because he al it allows him to carry on and you know fight another day to be the the rock of the church, right? That's interesting. What's what, What's funny about what just happened was. I forgot that you were projecting, so I was like, why is he speaking so loud? Because like, that's good. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, I had a little bit of that, that cat meme of when the, the cat's just like, whoa, when the eyes get really big. Um, okay. Excellent job, Al. Yes. Um, it also sort of puts me in mind of the notion of putting your vows aside briefly that you get within some forms of Buddhist monasticism mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, rather than attempting to repress your desire to go and drink and gamble and uh you know you can have a rum springer show up yeah exactly yeah yeah yeah. you get a period of getting to hang them up go and like flash a bit of ankle around town and then come back when you've got it out of your system mm -hmm. now it's not not the same thing but the idea that you could um mug yourself in terms of making oneself uh, unholy to to deny your savior mm -hmm. uh which is you know, by some accounts, the the only thing you need to do you're off is, the clock. Right, right, right. But I, th but then to make up for it is interesting. Well, the, yeah, and and then and who who is making up for it and who's documenting those things? That's a whole other thing because I don't want people to rail on me about like, well, how do we know he did it? We don't have any proof Peter existed except <laughs> there's some bones in Rome that are said to be his. Mm. Um, but the mythologizing of somebody in their own lifetime is always interesting. Yeah. Um, and and we see that with. Uh, family members very easily of like we try and say don't talk bad about the dead and suddenly they become these semi-gods of like <laughs> you're like but they were not a good person <laughs> like why are we well because that's the mythology that's how it works well also um, i wonder about the notion of reminding spirits to be good yeah of like we we you know if it's a difficult procedure to to cohere someone out of the you know the ocean of the dead or that they're having to come a long way to pierce that veil or something, or you know, then you want to make sure that you you know they're they're being called. The best of them is being called. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. Limiting limiting their access to you if you're like mm -hmm. no 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 you come as a doctor right now not as the tyrant you were. Yeah. Um, for sure. And there's also the side of when you call something, uh, you're gonna get the whole thing in some form whether you want to or not. So you know, right. yeah, pro appropriate procedures as far as, as spirits go. I with Peter the denial the small things and i've written about this before a couple of times just because I, peter is uh the 
the access point in many ways for for it's the crossroads saint right so it's right. it's the it's the it's the blockhead at the crossroads where you have to be very specific in your dealing with someone who is very literal mm. um, someone who is the authority of the church built upon but I also like the fact that the authority of the church is built on someone who denied Christ <laughs> that that there is an allowance for humanity here and Peter knowing the human Jesus is interesting so that Peter lies to defend his own humanity to defend himself. Um, and it's a mistake. He understands this. Uh, but it's a lie that comes out that is not premeditated. He distinctly says, I will not deny you to Jesus. And in that moment, he, when he's confronted with it, it shows that he doesn't know how he's going to react until that moment happens. Mm. And it allows a certain... It's I'm interested in those lies that come out of our mouths before we even have time to formulate them. Hmm. And it almost always happens in ego defense, which feels more immediate threatening than physical we don't lie when we're struck physically or we're being threatened physically. Right. There's pleading, mm. you know, but the response to ego defense is let me create an alternate world where I can get out of this. Um, and that's interesting that that's Peter because Paul is shifting truth. Paul goes from this is my belief to I have an experience and now I'm going to believe differently. So I deny the old past mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, you can say he's making up for it or whatever it is. That's not the point in my, in the way that I'm, I'm interpreting this. Uh, but I, I find that relationship with truth interesting that, that Peter changes the truth to defend his own butt and Paul changes the truth based on an experience that's something else. So confronted with this, he accepts it and moves on. And that's very interesting that you have the keys and the sword there being the, 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 the heraldry of these saints and, and Peter himself, I mean, we also have to acknowledge that Peter is the the rock that the church is built upon that there was no emphasis on petrine uh authority for a very long time because it was you get like gospel of thomas and other competitive gospels that will talk about no central authority and there is no reason for it and if you're emphasizing the spirit of christ like paul is this is about individual enclaves and mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. meeting wherever you can meet and the millennialism of the roman empire collapsing mm -hmm. and all these other things so there was no reason to have an empire on church. You were actually trying to usher in the second Jerusalem, not create one here. I was thinking about that in terms of crossed keys. I mean, there's there's, there's so much to get off that. But <laughs> the idea that all the keys are on one chain at the very least, or mm -hmm. that they're tied together, means that that's a centralizing thing, right? Someone has both of the keys, uh, as opposed to a, a sword which is splitting, is bifurcating. Uh, Except that I can look at a sword as a crossroad, too. Yeah. Because it's the cross, it's a it's a cruciform cross, mm -hmm. and there is uh, poetry that deals with the sword of Paul or the sword of anybody being laid down, and it's the the right, the left, and where you come from, but the sword pointing the direction that's most direct. Huh. So the line down the crossroads. But it's I understand that it's not unifying because it's definitely it's a cleaving instrument. It's a it's a blade, oftentimes two sided blade, right. and and a stabby. Oh. <laughs> truth as uh, analysis rather than truth as combining. And that kind of thing of cutting the past and changing and converting on a road to Damascus, a place known for its steel. <laughs> <laughs> and it's layering of things, interestingly. Right, right, right. Versus, uh, or in contrast to the, you know, his, his parallel, his, the, his double, if you like, on that road of, uh, of, the, of this crossing of, of keys. Mm -hmm. Of, of the, uh, the Kleidokos, not necessarily as key bearer through all the worlds. But also, yes, but also the, the that which blocks the road as well as that which opens the road. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting. With Peter, the it's almost a via negativa, right? That the, 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 the existence of Christ is proven by his denial of Christ in some way. Um, mm. the, 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 the opportunity is there to, to start a relationship, even if it starts in denial. And, and that is, for both of them, starts in denial of, of Christ. I mean, P Peter has a whole lifetime before and definitely those three years with Jesus are the, are the strong, but he has a much longer lifetime after Christ's death, mm. um, which is interesting. And, and I think it's interesting that Peter becomes the mascot for the physical church because it, it, it bases it in temporal authority. So if you're shifting from spirit of Christ and no, de no centralized church, that if you need to command land and command an empire and you need to base it on somebody, then it might as well be on Peter who was handed, he is the rock of the church. And the church now gets its actual authority from the myth of Peter. And the physical contact 
Yes. And, and, the, the, and the laying on of hands and things like that. Yes. And as opposed to you couldn't build it on Paul, though Paul is a great sword of Rome, but it's the he's the theology side mm. and, and Peter is the, the physical side that the apostles go on. And then also uh, Peter is felt to be, his memoirs are felt to be by some to be the source of the Gospel of Mark, um, which is highly debated, but still worth saying mm. that uh, he may actually be the, the source of um, the Q text, hmm. uh, which which is always interesting uh, when you talk about the fact that there's the, there's the synoptic gospels. There's three that are very similar, obviously based on some type of text um, that is that they're working off of. Then you have John, who's the renegade, um, who and none of these are proven to be the apostles. It's in the style of hmm. in the in the in the in the way of we have no guarantee that John the evangelist is John the apostle apostle. <laughs> wow, that's a good word. Um, John the Impossible is John. Great. John the Impossible. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Possible Apostle. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> wow. Okay. Uh, I I think with Peter, the, the the thing that's interesting with 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 Tradcraft is uh, again the, the the man at the crossroads, the man in black, that mm-hmm. that Peter is meeting us at the bottom of every road. That that this is our, for me, the interest, and I I've written about this in. Um, Serpent songs and just done blog posts before. I, the idea that for I really gravitate towards the crossroads of every moment. That the vows are renewed not because of an oath that was taken one time, but that it's a choice to renew those things. And each friendship is a choice to renew those things in the moment. Mm. The oath gets us through the dark times of like this person's being an asshole, but like. I'm choosing to hope for future opportunity where it cannot be an asshole or the, 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 the group or whatever it is, the marriage. But the, the idea that Peter is there at the bottom of every breath with the crossed keys and, and every moment becomes a possibility of heaven or hell in, in how you approach it, that things either nourish or deplete you. And oftentimes this is just a shift in attitude. And then sometimes it is a, I need to remove myself from the situation because this is too much energy to make it nourish me. Um, it's, it's going to nourish me more if I'm uh, able to nourish myself somewhere else, um, which leaving any group, leaving any marriage, leaving any decision is difficult. And there's always that thing of, you know, don't don't stay with something f- just because you spent a long time making the mistake. Bad money after good. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so Peter becomes the possibility of someone that can follow us on this road towards becoming ourselves. And is always the shadow there. It's always the other option. So the horned St. Peter, the left-handed saint, as I call them, um, is the confrontation. It is the rock that we face. It's our bashing our head against our rock. It's the rock in the hard place position. Mm. And and here we start. There We start in that humanity. We start in that denial of the thing we love most. And that is, there's a, there's, there's a hope there in that it's Peter. And that Peter himself, as a figure, understands that. And that Peter is easily syncretized with road opening spirits um, of of block headed spirits, and the, the two that have to come to mind quickly are as both Peter's syncretism as Legba in Vodou, as well as sometimes certain roads of Elegua or Eshu in 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 Ocha, mm. um, but also that Saint Peter is a wound in Ocha mm. is is heavily there, and you get that kind of block headed holding metal right. um, uh, spirit. And and who actually opens the way? Yeah, yeah. The the well, this the you know, we can tie that into later discussions on Irete and things like that. But you know, Elegua is not the opener of the road so much as he ones that owns the road. Elegua is the movement down the road, and Ogun is the one that opens them by cutting things down, literally. And Ogun was the one that opened the way into this world with the knife that with that Obatala was carrying. So Ogun is the road opener. And Elegua is the one who owns it, and there's an intrinsic relationship which we've talked about. I'm going to 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 bow out of the further thing of that because it's formulating still what's mm. how to phrase those things. But uh, yeah, I Peter and Paul this day will have many festivals in honor of those road opening, road owning. Uh, what is the the man that meets us? at the gates of heaven and says, can you get in or not? Mm-hmm. Um, that's fascinating. And right. The gold and silver keys. And yeah. And the idea conversely with Paul, that there is a road that opens you to something mm-hmm. like the, the conversion on the way on the road. I like that. 
just to do a nice little you know inside outside <laughs> duality as well if we're talking about those kinds of things no that's interesting what are your favorite things that are done on uh, this day in terms of um, you know with Peter yeah um, Peter and Paul um, I don't know it's a very difficult mass to go to for me um, because it's extolling the like virtues of the physical church and, and <laughs> like as much as I want to talk about the interesting things of Paul I also want to hit myself in the face because Paul is is hard to swallow um, there's some really beautiful stuff in there and there's some stuff that is just really difficult and I understand that logically and this is something that I see issues with even in it, 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 online interaction um, extolling dead men that have done horrible things but they had an interesting philosophical take on something it's a hard mix because logically to throw out the good they did because they did something bad makes no sense mm. it doesn't actually advance us mm. if the if the person is so dead that they're not making any money off of, of us extolling them anymore we are mythologizing them and that's its own thing mm. And we can talk about the bad things they did and educate on both, but there's also a tendency now to kind of want to throw out anything. Somebody, so when somebody has done something wrong, that is what's magnified or is uh, part of an institution of, of slavery or racism. And part of my gut reaction is absolutely, I agree with you. Like, like, like why are we giving credence to this? On the other side, I don't know where to go when part of that philosophy nugget that they give has done other things and is separated from their ownership of it because they're not benefiting from it anymore. Right. Um, it, it creates a, a, a new crossroads of like, where, where the fuck do we go with that? <laughs> um, and I think a lot of us find ourselves in this dilemma too of like when you, when you hear a worship or you find somebody, something bad about somebody, mm -hmm. it doesn't change the good they did on one level. On another level, yes, absolutely, because you're erasing it, but this is a, right. the battles of our, of our times of trying to find out how to balance this relationship with a figure that has done both good and bad. Sure, yeah. They've and, been human. And balance and tension is the, the, the tricky thing there, right? On the one hand, I, I totally buy that model that ideological purity is a, a bourgeois fantasy that's used to, to bash people and to and to disarm people mm -hmm. on the other hand you know I don't I, we, we can talk about you know is uh, is is Wagner's you know uh, odi are our Wagner's odious views implicitly imbued into his music uh, you know that whole Do you know the Leonard Bernstein quote mm -hmm. Leonard Bernstein uh, said Wagner I spit at you from my knees hmm. so the the idea that you can De dis despise something but still acknowledge that it's good mm. is is I, i've always loved that we were taught in peter school but just that that's from from my knees i spit oh. at you from my knees in worship oh. i hate you you're so good right you are not a good person mm. and i still want to acknowledge that you're good mm -hmm. uh at this thing right <laughs> so this is uh, that complexity of a relationship because we don't like that feeling of like pulled both ways that complexity we automatically, I think, as people want to steer mm. towards a resolution. Sure, of, sure. Make the judgment of good or bad. And it's like, we want to avoid the judgments of good or bad about other things, but like about a person. <laughs> you know, and that's the that's the hard part about mythologizing someone. Um, it, we can sit there and focus on the fact that Peter denied Christ, mm. the very person that he extols later, and we can hold them and say, that, but you denied him in the past, and what has he done since then? Mm. So the question of we can hold anybody to their faults um, what did they do after that point? It's a mm. whole other, other exploration. I don't know. I, I, yeah. I think for some people, because this is a you know conversation that uh, crops up a fair amount for me. I don't know. Some people seem to find talking about artists easier to separate from their political views, and some people tend to find theorists and philosophers weirdly easy to, to separate mm -hmm. between them and it, it 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 i feel it comes down to a sense of on the one hand you, is the has the artist imbued something in this wordless like music as the classic example or on the other hand are you able to theorize the theory and say okay this is where this can make sense where you don't have to have these axioms assuming you know say fascist principles of might is right you know we can we can pull that apart mm -hmm. uh, and it's one of the, the 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 fascinating things about um 
talking to our friend uh, Bill, who, who who teaches on Heidegger, and you know he's he's, he's the first to say like the the, the there's you know, absolutely terrible things about Heidegger. Like, uh, our revisionism is coming round from, uh, I don't think there's anyone still claiming, oh, he was just going along with the Nazis because he wanted to, you know, keep his job. Like he was actively shopping people. Uh, and also that his uh, anti-Semitism is so uh, ill-formed and uh, it's not it's not complicated. It's, it's bizarrely uh, kind of childish. Mm-hmm. In, in, in many ways. Maybe that's to give him too much credit to call it childish. Uh, it's, it's utterly odious, obviously. But that someone can be an amazingly complicated thinker about being and yet also, you know, be, be quite happy to make not just broad brushstroke racist remarks, but, but full on uh, crazy and, 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 and not just ill thought out, but like not thought out comments, it seems. Mm-hmm. And this is, again, for, for yeah com- a complexity of of a thinker and a, and a person. Well, it makes me, and this is not an apologism for philosophers, <laughs> uh, but I would, I'm curious, what you just made me think of is the, the level of, of and we can face it in the occult community, right? We, we, we think we're smart. Mm-hmm. We think we're intelligent and we hold ourselves to that intelligence. And because of that, because most, many, I won't say most, I can't speak for everyone, Many of the of the vocal people in in philosophy and the occult, which the occult is a form of philosophy, let's let's not shy away from that. Uh, you can, especially in the modern age, uh, be an expert on anything within a day, let alone a week or a month. Mm. If you fully commit yourself to studying the book lists about any subject, you can you can start arguing with with people very quickly. And that instant uh, appropriation of knowledge, and mm. I, don't, I don't mean misappropriation, I just mean appropriation here, of because you can learn about anything means that you must be an expert on everything. Mm. And I, having run a lot in philosophical circles, I, it is a common um, character flaw that I know a little about this thing, but I can argue with you who have known this thing for 30 years and let's put that on par. Hmm. Um, and, and you see this a lot in battles, current battles in the occult world, <laughs> of, oh, you read a book that references the thing I know very intimately, and you're going to drop that reference in your book about the thing you know intimately, and I'm going to call you out for referencing that thing, <laughs> um, and you're going to get upset. Mm-hmm. Or people are going to defend both sides based on, well, it should be okay to have comparative, yes, comparative literature is a thing. Um, that was a very British pronunciation for me, <laughs> <clears throat> but I, I, I'm curious if the potential for that kind of huge ego identification with being the smart one or being the knowledgeable one affects us all in that way of, uh, you know, because I could know as much as you do, mm-hmm. I must be emotionally, I'm emotionally attached to the no- idea of knowing, which interesting, Paul is denying the the reality of Christianity and making fun of Christians when he's Saul and then converts and becomes this other side of like you must go down this road and, and love is patient and love is kind mm. and um and you know women serve your husbands um and it, all those things that are there and right. this is often the the side of it of it goes against it's like a weird bringing the the, the quote unquote New Testament the Christian Testament back to the things that were picked apart about the the Hebrew Testament hmm. of you're trying, Jesus is getting away from la, 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 la and saying, stop being an asshole, treat people as you want to be treated and love God and see God everywhere. What are the great commandments? Overriding the 613 commandments, overriding the big 10 hmm. and like filter things through this first. And then you have Paul who goes back and is like, you know, fornication is bad. Prostitutes are bad, except that Jesus hung out with those people. Um, you know, you're not going to save sinners if you're not hanging around sinners. So you're already seeing a projection of, you know, a proto-Republican take on what they think Jesus or what they want Jesus to have said, as opposed to his life and times. Well, yeah, and, and I think it's it's fair. Like, the modern Republicanism is, is very different from other Republicanism, and I don't want to start a war of... Um, anti-republicanism uh, for the historical clout of it of like if you look at republican theory 
is very different until the advent of abortion. Like even the Catholic Church was so Democrat until abortion became an issue. And then they could not side with mm. pro-choice. They had to defend life. And then everything got colored after that. Mm. So it's a 20th century phenomena that started shifting politics to include religion, including all these other things. It was an economic formula before that. Mm. So I'm not apologizing for anybody or other side. I just want to say that proto-modern -cons conservative Republican revisionism Mm -hmm. uh, which is a symptom also of American Protestant Christianity of let's go back and rewrite history of let's mythologize things that we actually know about right. to conveniently fit my story. Let me rewrite the facts, hashtag false, false, fake news, hashtag false facts, whatever the different things are of, you know, the, the people who are want to be ignorant of church history and say that there's no such thing as a Protestant Reformation. Our religion goes back to John the Baptist mm -hmm. um, acknowledging Christ. That's lovely. But we know differently. And then you can say, well, who wrote that history down? And you can argue that, but it becomes this thing of like, any time a tradition is created and someone says, oh, this is the traditional model. Okay, what's wrong with showing the historical side and saying like, spirits told me to do this and it's working better, so I'm doing it this way. Um, if, you know, it doesn't have to be all granny stories of being, you know, right. having sex with your grandmother, Alexander's, in, in your attic and, and getting somehow the book that Gerald Gardner and Valiente wrote and, and purporting that that was the book you were given when you had sex with your grandma. Mm -hmm. um, to be fair, they left it open by saying it was the book. But I also don't think Americans understand the British sense of humor about this and the Masonic history of saying, I just discovered an old something <laughs> and, and presenting the kind of mythic context to make it go forward that there, that that sometimes the second generation is not in on the joke. Mm. And there's that side of it. But I think I think specifically uh, British Masonry and how it, uh, it, it evolves its stories around things to kind of, let's pretend as if. Wouldn't it be fun to pretend? Which is a very... British phenomena with ritual there and the Americans who are being very literal with it who are like well they're not obviously they're not pretending this must be the ancient document in this mm. way handed down which we see in grimoires mm. of referencing ancient things you're like this is the book that was handed by this by this spirit to this spirit to this spirit which gives authority to the book this is the church that was founded upon Peter's bones right. even though it wasn't contiguous mm -hmm. and we say there's other popes in between but like really <laughs> really were there or you know it's 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 the it's the Rosalia influence of like I'm I, this saint came to me in a dream I'm gonna go find her bones it doesn't matter that they look like goat bones <laughs> this is the bones that I had to find mm -hmm. to justify this dream to justify this this thing and uh, all that is very interesting how we revise the past how the the phenomena of the more you think about something the more you change it the more you remember a memory yeah. the more the memory is not accurate to what happened the afterlife of texts oh. and when the spirit summons another spirit when a spirit is possessed by another spirit <laughs> <laughs> oh that's such it's such a nightmare right of like i just want to remember my you want to remember a dead one mm -hmm. i don't remember my grandfather a certain way and to know that i'm focusing also in my my emotional attachment to those things changes the shape of his face in my memory mm. that is that is an interesting mm. thing so we we are the, the the authors and the designers of our own memories in that way we are co memora co-remembering along with what happens so i guess you have apologies for people that do revise mm. of like it's it is it is a history a historical tendency uh, or a natural tendency, I think, of us to want to mythologize in that way, and yeah, but, we we build the bridge halfway there. That was a long rabbit hole. I'm sorry, <laughs> thinking about things from last night too, from the from the folk neck talk. But yeah, that feels like a a good point to to bring in Honorius, right? Yeah, or several of these other things, right? <laughs> You're talking about childishness and and um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the complexities of that thing and then talking about Mirim and, and Puer and, and what these are but um, yeah that's, we don't spend enough time on dead magicians so mm. Honorius let's go well the two bits of, of specifically grimoire tech because that doesn't have to be the case with dead magicians but it, it just so happens this one is uh, the, the two main grimoires uh, associated with Honorius are the the uh more recent one, uh, when I say more recent, somewhere, but you know, texts of it depend on the 1600s to the 1700s, uh, the, the grimoire of Pope Honorius. But then, of course, we also have the, the Sworn Book, uh, which is, you know, considerably uh, older by at least a, a good couple hundred years. And it's this one that, you know, 
some people get a little bit misty eyed about the notion of actual medieval magic and that this is, uh, you know, uh, kind of worth exploring because, as we were saying earlier, the Sworn book, you know, it's 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 kind of a one stop shop. You could you could say that it has, you know, which directions you face in for which planets it has. Um, enough of a thumbnail sketch of the appearance and nature of the spirits uh, of each of the planets that's going to turn up, uh, which is, by the way, also particularly humoral uh, in terms of talking about the... the... Isn't everything with you? Well, yes, but also... I mean, with, you know, a thousand years as well. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's funny that... <laughs> Why does all the art involve religious figures for so long? That's just sad. <laughs> But yeah, talking. Well, I think it's it's useful to to frame that because it's very, again, it's very easy to look at humoral theory as you know bad medicine that we've you know uh, thrown out. But when you're talking about the appearance of spirits and and you're like, why is this spirit you know tall and gaunt, or why is this one have a a, a comportment that is you know um, corpulent, right? Then these things are. are Would are, you call me? <laughs> The Jupiter of my friends, <laughs> the tallest. Uh, <laughs> um, there's an eternal storm somewhere near my navel. <laughs> uh, wait, <laughs> threw wait, you wait. off there, didn't I? I really did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sucked into the navel. Uh, um, so yeah, it has, has appearance of spirits. It has, a, it has uh, detailed listings of how it feels when you've made contact with those spirits, mm -hmm. you know, which can be incredibly physiological. You know, there's, uh, I think it's Mercury, maybe, that, uh, you, that the operator will start sweating. And that's how you know that you've, you know, you've plugged the thing in and that you're, you're getting the, the current from it. Got there, that down. Right. There are also, you know, visionary things. The, the spirits, of, you'll know that the Jupiterian working is working when you you might see uh, lions devouring Christians outside of the circle, which I really like because I feel that combines... <laughs> you hate Christians? No, <laughs> because I feel it combines Jupiter's two kind of places there. On the one hand, it's a very Roman image mm -hmm. of yes. like a public, you know, spectacle thing. Of, You're of, in your window of, box of, as the yeah, emperor. Yeah, 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 of imperial might. And on the other hand, it's that piety to, you know, not Io anymore, but to Jove. And uh, you know the and the great sacrifice and uh, and 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 the you know the 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 history of of of, of Christianity emerging from an oppression to hopefully you know uh, have a kindlier heart and all of that nice Jupiterian uh, beneficence uh, yeah that one that one makes a lot of sense to me in terms of uh, again uh, if only as a as a heraldry of of what might be seen right um, so yeah. Uh, the Swan Book has has plenty to, to, to recommend it, um, but of course we're also talking about, you know, uh, Honorius' dead magician is already sort of mythic in terms of, for a start, which Honorius mm -hmm. Pope, right? Because we've got three to pick from, right? So three come three is around about the time that it looks like the Swan Book turns up. Yeah, the third the third Honorius Pope, mm -hmm. Papa. Uh, you know, if you look at timelines, and, and re, we, we do actually do a little bit of research before these things. It's not like we pull these facts out of our butt, despite what we might be accused of. Um, uh, no, all the errors are are completely uh, traceable to just, well, us. But uh, anyway, uh, Honorius III is uh, a short-reigned pope, actually. Uh, not quite that long, but 12, 16 to 12, late, late 12, 20s. Um, and uh, this is around the time that the, the book seems to have appeared. Uh, it's 13th century, certainly not necessarily during that narrow reign of, of, of 15 years-ish, but uh, if you were going to have a book that said the sworn book of Honorius that came out within 50 to 75 years of a pope's death, uh, you, you might think that it was about him. Yeah. Um, you're so vain. <laughs> you might think this grimoire is about you. Um, oh, that's another maxim of occultism right there. Wow. Mm. Uh, okay. So the other side of it is that there's a, a huge reference later on to go back to the original Honorius, Honorius I, who is 7th century, who is a, a heretic pope. Mm. Um, and that side of it in dealing with Peter and Paul is quite interesting because I think I didn't 
when we pick the list of things, there is kind of a free association of like, we need a plant, just pick a plant, any plant. Mm. And then it's almost like, why did that come up? Like Honorius came up because of the papacy. Mm. But I also think it's interesting to consider with the nature of what we're talking about with Peter and Paul, the human and the divine, that Peter had an experience of the human side of Jesus, which led to his understanding of the divine. And Paul had a, an experience of the divine side of Jesus, which led to understanding humanity on some level. I mean, I can't necessarily know what Paul's thoughts are right. on, on understanding the human side of Jesus. But Honorius I was, um, he was a, a, a uniwillist. Uh, uh, that's, that's not the technical term, I'm making that up. Uh, but the, the argument at the time and the heresy of discussing the two wills of Christ, that, that is Christ 100% human and 100% divine, and how can you have 200%? The other side of it is uh, there were those that were saying that, no, he was divine. Hmm. Um, there, were no, there were probably no more at that time saying he was human. Um, that was an early Christian philosophy that, that got stamped out real quick. Um, uh, that bad. That's very bad. Um, so he's either divine or human and divine. Right. Um, but uh, I'm sure that's a lot. The, the heresy of saying that Jesus was just a human comes up in, in modern times quite a bit. But uh, at that time period, the argument was that uh, how could he be both and what does this mean? And... There's apologists for Honorius in his saying that, no, he had one will. And really, we know that politically he was trying to stop the conversation, mm. that it was not advantageous. It was causing a split in the church, which was still trying to gain momentum. Right. It was trying to unify the church, keep its lands and its power to say, we're not going to talk about this. Christ had one will. Mm. And that the apologists for this are saying that not that he was saying he was only divine, but that there was nothing in the human will that could conflict with the divine will. So it's a unified will. So I love these times when you're talking about one plus one equals one <laughs> or, uh, or the kind of the Kabbalistic maximum of God is, God is one, but not in counting. It's not about one God instead of 80 billion gods. It's about the unity of divinity, mm. the, the, the completion of the, the, the oneness of I something. Mean, oneness so one, here yeah. you're talking about the oneness of will as opposed to one will, one will versus two wills. And, uh, you know, it's very hard. I hear the word will coming out of my mouth and it sounds like I'm being lazy and saying wheel um, because two wheels is easy to say. Um, so that is interesting with Honorius that you're talking about the oneness. As an apologist, that's what they were saying, right. um, that, that people were going back and saying he wasn't really a heretic. Mm. And um, by the way, here's a magic book ascribed, ascribed to him. <laughs> um, I don't see evidence of the great heresy in the text. Mm -hmm. um, so why he's the why he's the pope that is this thing but the heretic pope is obviously the one that people are going to say and excuse magic to i would assume mm. because this is the easy the easiest there of like yeah. okay honorius the third fine there's medieval catholic magic we know that there is a belief that because they are higher up the chain they also want to maintain power what are they doing to maintain power and how are they getting ahead and what are they doing behind crossed keys yes exactly and and um subclavian if you will um, <laughs> and, um, and this that is interesting right so so it, it helps you can ascribe it to any heretic you can ascribe it to what it is but Honorius himself Honorius the magician is what the son of Euclid and a leader amongst the Thebians mm -hmm. which also allows uh, Agrippa to attribute the is it Agrippa that attributes mm -hmm. the Theban alphabet yeah. to Honorius um, or Honorian is the other name of the Theban alphabet which mm -hmm. is received great attention uh, due to the the Wiccan use of it. But isn't it also now, as a result of that association, kind of, I don't know, does it, uh, is it out of fashion? It is absolutely, hipsters should not use it. <laughs> it will, I predict, be another 15 years before it comes back. Say, it but no, I've already, you've already seen those. You've already seen people that, like, to be fluent in writing the Theban script is not popular anymore. Right. But those people that do it, I have a heart a heart a heart place? a heart on a heart on yeah i was gonna say a soft spot or a, a spiritual heart like part of my little heart still stirs and i'm like you memorized an alphabet good for you like like i don't mean that sarcastically no, i no. actually mean like good for you Even, yeah. i find the theban alphabet both beautiful and really ridiculous to use because so many letters look like other letters right like you know one of the critiques perhaps um uh egotistically of the of the latin alphabet is its ease in reading is not the best i'm not going to say that it's the best but there are many alphabets out there that you look at and you're like why 
this looks so too similar to something else. Like one of the mainstays of orthography is going to be to have differentiated characters, and but that also depends on whether or not it's a, a uh, is the term true alphabet versus a it, it's it's a, it's a gloss, right? It, it, it's a, it's a it's a translation. It's a cipher. Yeah. Right. It, it's 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 not a it's not a language in of itself. It's a way of writing the letters we already have. Yes. And so. It does. So perhaps part of the argument of keeping the secrets from the profane is that it is difficult to to, to know. It's also kind of similar, um, you know, as a as a, as a throwaway comment. Uh, I, I made friends with a a, a Georgian guy, and uh, you know, his the, the the alphabet that they use is is, is kind of similar, um, mm-hmm. especially some of those like long tall tails coming down to like m-shaped things yeah and and speaking as someone who loves to play with calligraphy like the theban alphabet is really good for modifying into like pseudo tolkien pseudo arabesque <laughs> like wonderful sweeping tails of things mm. um and that lovely period symbol mm-hmm. that's like what is that <laughs> um that's like some you know uh, personally you know i am more moved to play with Hildegard's invented alphabet hmm. or, you know, I have no problem with Tolkien invented alphabets because like more people can read that than they can read Theban, which is possibly a bad thing for keeping your magical books in. Hmm. Um, but if we're talking about just the, the code generation, it is a very weak cipher. Hmm. It is a very weak code. It's a one for one. Oh, sure. Um, and with the except in many magical alphabets, it's mainly, you know, it's the, it's the Iranian barbaric argument that we can bring up again of like, it doesn't matter what it is as long as it's translated away from being instantly recognizable. Mm. So one could argue, um, uh, there are certain schools of esoteric dance that I, I, I have heard it said, once you learn this dance, it's n- you never do it again. So once you master that dance, you are not allowed to do it. The, the struggle and the learning is there. So oh. the, if I apply that to the alphabets, it could be interesting in the sense, or the, 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 the codes as they were, as they are, uh, that perhaps one of the benefits to Theban being difficult to read easily is that you shouldn't be able to read it at a right. glance. Um, that is it about, I know more than you and I know the secret code to access this thing, or is it about disguising from the eye of the instant association? Because let's face it, once you are able to read, it is very hard to not see a word. Mm. Extremely hard to not see a word. Mm. And the, the quote unquote, uh, fascinated by the term the devil of associations which has come up in, in other things but like the brain jumping from its focus because it recognizes something and wants to recognize something we see a face in nature because we are programmed to see nature or to see faces just to, to to change the meaning of what i was saying there um <laughs> but we are programmed to see faces as humans and, and after we read it is very hard to unsee a word mm. the um oh the book uh the I was just I just finished it and I can't remember the title written in stone maybe it's called the it is a a fiction book I picked it up at Treadwells when I was there um it is a, a Mesopotamian scholar hmm. he, he he's an, an antiquarian hmm. I love that term um <laughs> who is who is fluent in cuneiform mm-hmm. wrote a novel because there are pyrite naturally occurs in dice shape hmm. and there are clusters of crystals on the sides of these things that um look like cuneiform so his thought was what if this was handed to someone who spoke read cuneiform and the, the the struggle of the brain going i can almost read this word i can read this word why can't i read this word and thinking that there's a word that the gods have given you that you can't interpret because it's not actually cuneiform but it looks like the little dove marks piled on each other and he writes a book based on an exorcist in the kingdom finding these on a dead magician and then going on a psychotic kind of uh, not quest, but just understanding of it and the people that he has to kill and the lies wow. that are told to just, like, he just wants to know what the gods are telling him. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating to me. So, like, the, <laughs> the, the seeing words, I think he actually coins a new term in the end of, in the appendix, um, trying to, fit, we talk about graffiti, which is mm-hmm. human interaction, but what is it when nature speaks in language to us that we recognize? And I think he calls it, um, paragraph. Um, but there's mm-hmm. this, uh, I'll have to go back, and if I say that, I'll go and edit it correctly. <laughs> but uh, the book was a fun read, and I'm sorry I'm terrible at the name as to what it is. Um, no, but that's that, that very much sounds like parts of... We think about Doctrine of Signature as morphology, as the thing that looks like lungs, so we call it lung war, and it, we, we presume it's good for some kind of pulmonary thing. But the 
idea of writing on things that the spots could be connected up the the, the stars themselves could be constellated to to reveal particular things that the markings on stones or uh, animals or plants could be almost words that like literally words that we that we that we have to join together and read and then it becomes an exercise in how we join them and what it what it can be saying in that moment yeah, it becomes interesting i think for sure Yeah, I believe uh, the writing in the stone is the is the name of the the book. I cool. Believe. Um, and uh, Irving Finkel, perhaps. Hmm. Uh, just quick, quick search so that I don't feel like I'm plugging a book without actually plugging it because it was an enjoyable read. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it, like any exploration and creativity, when it also I have to reread the book because of my own devil associations in the first read was like oh my god and this and this and it's making me think of all these things and then you have to go back and read the book because you also want to make sure that you actually read the book mm -hmm. and it's like watching a, a play the 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 best stage productions i've seen i've had to go see numerous times not because like oh there's something new every time in the romantic way in the depth of it it's something new because my brain went off somewhere on a crusade to find creativity so um, does that mean that when you have allusions or homages or spoofs or satires in something that you're actually marshalling someone's devil of associations you're oh, like, maybe uh, <laughs> you're like i know what you just quoted and now i'm thinking about that thing but the writer is like yeah i know you know that and and i'm making sure that you're thinking about that thing so that when this happens well if it's done well <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're making yourself beautiful with someone else's cock on a basic level. <laughs> um, uh, so there, there could be. The question is, if you go into the like a postmodern analysis of that, sorry, NYU. Um, at a certain point, it doesn't matter. It's like, what do you get out of it? Right. And like, we can go into the philosophical meanings of like the writers in that way. And and, but I do think it's interesting of. Uh, Sure, in in our own references, if we say a quote or refer to something uh, that was said last night or in a comedy we both knew or a mm -hmm. book we might the other person might know, mm -hmm. we're using the strength of that allu that allusion to to add to the conversation and not have to speak about that other thing in depth. Right, it's shorthanding, which on, is on what language way. is on right. one level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. we're we're referencing concepts and and the words themselves are dancing around what those concepts are. I'm we agree upon a cliche of what book is mm -hmm. but i might include book as to mean 80 billion things and you might include you know it, what what is what is it when we mention the color this is obviously cognitive linguistics theory here but like what is black except the collection of everything you've ever been told is black mm. that there's the concept of blackness of of the of the 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 color that is not a color in art theory it's a neutral <clears throat> or the color red and the different shades of what that are that in, in, in Western European theory, red is a specific thing mm. versus uh, West African theory. It's about brightness and vibrancy and not pallidness or darkness, which would start to change its actual color definition. Mm -hmm. So it, these are culturally embedded and things like that, but it's also because you've been told that that thing is red or that thing right. is... So that, that when we attempt to learn new things, we're feeding on only the limited resource of what we've already uh, been, been told. Oh, that's depressing. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I, I, the, the, I like to think about it in the, uh, David Graham Smith, and I'm going to, he's going to, I'm going to misquote him, I'm sure. But I was at a, been to a couple lectures that he's done. Uh, but we were talking, someone brought up Cliff Hoth, because you can't go to a Kabbalah lecture and not have someone bring up Cliff Hoth. Mm -hmm. But he was saying everything has Cliff Hoth. Everything, it's the shell. It's the, it's the limits of the understanding about it. And that when you rub up against the cliff, that you can start to make a cliff on the and you start to make it a luminous boundary, a luminous shell that then can break and you can increase past it. Mm. So like a, a worm in a chrysalis, at a certain point you can break out of the chrysalis, but there's another chrysalis past that. You just don't know where it is yet. Mm. So that understanding itself, our concepts of something can be viewed in this onion layer of thin shells that we can break through. We have the potential to break through. But they are endless. Mm. That, that that only when we get all the way up into Ensof and the, the oneness, the, the God is one but not in counting area, do we actually find ourselves free of Cliffoth. Mm. So this it's an interesting thing of like there, there's no there's no dark tree, light tree in that philosophy. It's they're intertwined. There is no dualism of either or. And I find anytime you start going into to non-oppositional dualism, I'm there. I'm I'm happily like 
I eschew all the other dualism in order to embrace this new dualism, which is, you know, hopefully everyone sees through the funniness of that. Um, but that that side of it of Peter and Paul opposition as to what they are. Mm -hmm. Interesting on one feast day. I'm just going to bring back the things that actually tie it to how how these weird Sesame Street episodes work. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So Honorius. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the importance of the swarm book, and we were talking about this earlier, is that there is this, I mean, I certainly have it. I can't imagine it. I'm the only one that has this. Earlier is better. <laughs> earlier means more ancient and more knowledge. And, and does that play into the fall of man theory? Mm. Does that play into the, like, in the golden age when gods walked with men? Right. You know, the further back something is, the more accurate it probably is. And you're like, well, that's completely wrong about that's, medicine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And certainly language itself, we know that the more complex a language, usually the older it is, mm. um, that language simplifies over time because that's what you do. The water rubs over the rocks and smooths the edges out. Mm. So ancient languages often have more cases, more qualifiers, more ways of talking to people. And the more you get towards a written language and things, things unify, spelling unifies. What that is, is like you as an early modern scholar, I'm sure come across this all the time of, we're not quite sure what this exact word meant because it could be five things that sound like the way he spelled it. Yeah. And yay! <laughs> Is that a flying bull or a flying bowl in the air? Uh, yeah, yeah. That was the that was the vision I was and, looking at the other day. <laughs> Damn you, pseudo Scottish influence of, mm -hmm. of pronunciation. Mm -hmm. um, this one's also a letdown when I watch those YouTube videos of like Shakespearean pronunciation, and there's that father and son that are really adamant that like. Oh, I think they call. I think it's the crystals. I think and, that's the surname. Oh. And the, like, it's not. A, I love that they're so nerdy about yeah, it. That's yeah. fantastic. But I was like, that wasn't that different. Right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't yeah. suddenly switch to Estonian on me. Like, <laughs> like, I feel a little like I was looking for like you know the the alien language that comes down and speaks in clicks and to be, um, uh, and, and shuffles of scales on the yeah. back of the throat and 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 and, and heptapods in in yes. circular language. See, that was it. That was a fun like break my brain open a little bit of circular language non 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 linear time. Mm -hmm. Yay, Mesoamerica. Um, <laughs> And, and how to operate in both worlds at the same time. Oh, multiculturalism, does it actually exist? Or are you just making new culture? Hmm. Um, forging ahead, there is no authenticity, nothing is true. Oh, it all comes back to chaos magic. Um, or at least Hassan Isaba. Well, the alternative is that Prisket theologia, right? That notion that the, the earliest transmission was the best and that that's why we're pursuing the earlier thing because it's the closest to God and everything else is... It's again, it's, it's like an emanationism uh, in in in, yes. in history, right? That that we have to get back to the source. What what, what was the source? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, even in Honorius, right? The the belief that that Honorius was not talking about here, or his belief. Uh, oh, it's funny when we I study notes but don't necessarily go into the details. So I'll I'll propose the idea as opposed to ascribing it to it. But it was in the in the looking at Honorius that that Jesus did not come to rectify Adam's nature but to reunite us with the nature that existed before Adam's fall. Mm. So human nature was something different, and Jesus' human nature echoes that, which is actually divine nature because it was before the fall. Right. So the, the Adam Kadmon experience of, of, of how do you become both things and how do you unify opposites, how do you become both Adam and Hawa, Adam and Eve, as one thing and the divine hermaphrodite and what mm -hmm. these go on and opposition that is not op oppositional. Right. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Their um, non-dualistic dualism, or non-dualistic non-dualism, dualistic something. Anyway, there are actually terms for this, and if I had kept in school, I would know them. Mm -hmm. But I dropped out <laughs> of, of graduate school for now. Anyway, I challenge you, sir. Then, uh, if we're gonna keep on talking about popes in this way and the about the uh, ability to make. Uh, grand sweeping decisions and change church philosophy and all these things um, with the quickest side of like I do think it's quite interesting that Pope Francis is both a hero to like a lot of the occult world because he's changing what the official voice of the Catholic Church is yeah. and at the same time when he does something that is in line with the Catholic Church everyone's like no I hope so right. he was like he's not Superman he's yeah. still a Catholic Pope yeah, yeah, he's yeah. still fighting for you the Catholic you were meant to be the chosen one yeah right, um, right. But I still, I, I do find his even own doctrine on a papal infallibility of like, 
infallibility what like how do you <laughs> how do you that's that's fascinating to me um so i'm i am thankful for that this is the pope that replaced palpatine right um and uh my catholicism has never you and your wife ta- i and your wife and i'm sure you and your wife have talked about this quite a bit but like catholicism for a lot of us is not about doing what rome says right. um it's it's uh, for hispanic catholics and for for, for my framework it's uh it's just a word that got added into everything, how it is, and this is the culture and how it does things. Mm. And it's a way of working and a way of interacting with the world and kind of indeed uni- uni- unifying it um, under the umbrella of some mythical man from the mythical land of Rome that I've never met. <laughs> um, you know, Wales is a sephiroth. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's from far away, which is part of that whole, you know, there's, there's definitely the argument of, Again, if we're, back, we're going to return to Prisca Theologia and that, that notion that there was this... You know, I giggle when you say that word. I'm am, sorry. I, am, I, am I pronouncing it? No, wrongly? it's just because it makes it... It's it's to hear it when you know you're used to reading words and not discussing words. Yeah, yeah. And so to say Prisca Theologia, it kind of makes it sound like I've got like a rash. Protagonist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, okay. Um, but it's, this, it's the same thing. It's, it, you can call it exotification, <laughs> but it's also a... Uh, distancing something so that it can be bigger. Ah, yeah. The, well, the mythologizing of something that is that is measurably a certain amount away from you. Yeah. And therefore, you know, even you know, reminded of Church Latin, right? Why does Church Latin sound the way it does? Uh, because at some point they wanted to unify Latin mm-hmm. because people were traveling more and it sounded weird and there were divergent versions of what Latin was. Yeah. And so they looked at the parishes around Rome and said, let's pronounce it like they're pronouncing it because they're close to Rome. Mm. And so you get this this unification. Great. Uh, it's kind of like when everyone says, like, we should all speak one language. You're like, great. Let's speak Klingit. <laughs> and now you know what it's like. You go like, oh, no, we should all speak English. Well, how how bully for you that you, you've decided that that's the language we should all go to. That's that's the problem with that type of thing. First off, also, and then I mourn the, 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 all the, the ways of thinking we lose when we stop those languages. Of course. Um, but that's the, the bad anthropologist in me. Okay, so where I was going... Mm-hmm. Did you finish up with Prisca Theologia? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the rash has ended. Uh, the the hierophant and this notion of leadership and authority and mm-hmm. um, papacy, right? The, the papal bullshit, mm-hmm. um, as well as the papal bull, um, ex cathedra, and what that means. Which someday I'm going to have Al do the damn episode on the chair of Saint Peter, which is like <laughs> a thing I want to discuss mm-hmm. because to to have a saint day for the butt rest of the first pope. <laughs> I will I will defend this on the feast of Peter. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Hierophant himself kind of as a as a cared, as a cad. As a cad. <laughs> well, on the tree of life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which tree of life, Al? Indeed. Which? Indeed. The witch's tree of life? So there's a triplicity going on, right, with the with the crosses and also with the, the steps going up, depending on which um, uh, iconography we're, we're using. But the if we're going by the Times New Roman of Tarot, the Rider Waite Smith, there's the there's the three. S- <laughs> Are you like that? Yeah. Oh, that was good. Uh, oh, is there a sans serif version? <laughs> What's the sans serif? I don't know. I feel like a lot of them are the basically comic sans tarot. papyrus these days. Oh, oof. yeah. That was a <laughs> wow. Um, okay. Shade thrown. Yeah, I'm. I'm always interested in those three steps. The 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 the, the triplicity model. The the weirdest. Uh, or, or, or the two bald heads. Right. And the right, big right. old one face. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly. I mean, uh, I can. I, I usually imagine them kneeling. I think that's that's fair. Maybe they're just short. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, what was I going to say the um, the the reading that I've, I've I've seen that's most kind of secularized is the idea of all of this tradition and this drive of establishment and uh, a kind of authority or, or a sense of, of, of something that rules is um, oh is is the Wizard of uh, of Northampton is is Alan Moore's uh, tarot in uh, Promethea where he, he 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 gives the hierophant to the force of evolution. Because he wants to do a map of uh, the fall to the world as a uh, a full map of the the history of um, creation. Mm-hmm. So the 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 fall is is is, is um, either the Big Bang or prior to the Big Bang, uh, and and this by the point of um, you know the the empress as the, as, as the actual uh, earth and things. Then you you get to the the hierophant at five and 
um, what once you've got um, the Earth and then uh, gravity and maybe an ozone layer as the as as, uh, <laughs> as, the, as the emperor of, of, of that which has uh, which puts in place the structure that allows life the airy body of Jupiter. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. But then the then the uh, the the Aries the, the Aries Jup- that kicks it <laughs> off the Aries yeah, body yeah. of Jupiter. Uh-huh. <gasps> ah. Ah. Uh, you'd think we were drunk. Um, <laughs> Oh, that would be more fun. Uh, not that you're not fun. Oh, um, you just need alcohol to get through it. I just need I just need something to deal with you. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, so yeah, the the idea that once you've got all the all the the the, the board and the the rules of the game, that evolution uh, can be can be considered a hierophant, which is odd in terms of a uh, if you think about it as uh, religious establishment, the hierophant as you know, uh, uh, in its most negative dogma and the inflexibility of a centralized um, spiritual or religious authority, but the idea of a tradition that we're already doing and that we're we're living up to uh, is interesting to me. I think, uh, and that's 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 what I ended up pondering on for a while about about the hierophant and nails as well, right? Go on. Well, if we're talking. You know the, the 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 triple cross, the the triple crown, the three steps, um, that the, you know, uh, the cabalistic way of, of thinking about the the letter attributed to it is is the nail sometimes. Mm-hmm. So the idea of the three nails that are, are necessary for any of the the popes ultimately to be deriving an authority mm-hmm. uh, is is interesting. And, and the the supernal triplicity of of the the big three above the the veil, right? So Keter, yeah, Bino Chokma, but. Uh, also, that the card I, I find the kind of repaganizing of the card in the Rider Waite interesting too. That the, the hierophant is not the older name; it is the Pope. Mm. And there's the Popess, which is the high priestess. So you have the high priestess, and then we can't say high priest and show the Pope, which just gets weird for mm-hmm. people. So it has to be uh, Ed, yeah, um, the the daddy. Um, <laughs> uh, that's there are decks that say the daddy, um, but uh, that it's it's referencing the Eleusinian mysteries. Uh, and beliefs about the the hierophant being the high priest there, uh, so there's a reference to authority and and being able to conduct religious uh, ritual, and also shows that the, the tarot is a mutable thing. Right. <laughs> that the, that we would love it to be this this ancient Honorian Egyptian, uh, uh, Sumerian, <laughs> directly me- derived on a Superman meteor from outer space yeah. of ancient truth. But again, this is these are being designed, and and I think the thing with Rider Waite is that it is, of course, designed for not just divination on a, on one level, but like a real exploration of a mystery mm. school with all its fallacies as to what it is and everything. But that the there is extreme. It's not to say that other tarots and other cards are not designed with symbolism, or. Ooh, the word, um, <laughs> but with 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 intentional references to things that are not of the card itself. Right. Uh, but that there is something different with the Rider weight. Um, I, th- I think of five also, and think of the fingers of the hand and the hand of authority, the hand of God on earth mm. is interesting. Plus the three nails going into the hand, and the the relationship between three and five, Christianity wise. Um, there's also five figures in the card if you count the two crossed keys. That are mm. at the base, which is referencing Peter's hands, mm. which is interesting too. So five and three becomes five, and back again, and all these other things is, and the the papal tiara of of the three layers as to what that is. Um, that the card was sometimes called Jupiter as well as well as Pope. Mm. Um, uh, the Italians had fun with that kind of pagan resurgence, mm. um, but yeah. I, it's an interesting card. It pontiff, the build, the, the authority of the church. The it's. I think uh, many sources go into this, but to understand tarot on a non-modern level is interesting in the sense of there is no doubt in the Pope at the time that the cards are being made. This is a this is a scary figure. Also, a card of extreme judgment and it, and uh, the the. The big hand of the law coming down on you, church authority coming down and making a decision, right. had to have played into early interpretations on a divinatory level. Yeah, yeah. Um, because this is this is the representation of God on earth. This is the representative of God on earth. Right. As opposed to the emperor. Yes. Who's also about his rules. Yes. But... And so, and uh, I like the, you have, in the evolution of how things go, right, you have the earth and you have this high priestess and everything that comes out in a different way from the fool's journey and and. and uh, you have this kind of authority that is 
feminized, feminine, and uh, is not about rule mm. so much as expansiveness in either uh, the the religious side of the high priestess, quote unquote, the spiritual side, let's say, in the modern context, mm. and the the empress who is duty to to be uh, the fecund earth in this way, the 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 throne of the emperor in many ways in the way that the tarot is going. And so can we separate tarot from the enlightenment theory that we all can't separate ourselves from in the West and, and loved the article that the same bill was sharing, um, basically calling out enlightenment philosophy for it's, it, you cannot separate slavery and colonialism from it. Right. And that part of the, the shattering of Western ego in, in, in modern era is that you can't actually take slavery and colonial thought out of enlightenment thought yep. and therefore when we attack slavery and colonialism as we rightly should we will be attacking enlightenment thought and we will have to come to terms with the civilization we built around that type of theory and the philosophy and the language and everything that's that's there so it will feel like an attack it will feel like a physical attack yeah. um, on the mental constructs because we we're, we're dismantling something yeah. um and um that's fascinating and awesome uh, because it also gives a context mm -hmm. and also explains, like, why do you feel so attacked? Hmm. Um, because your world is crumbling. Yeah. It doesn't mean that the world's coming to an end. It means your world is going to look different yeah. in the future. Um, I, at least I would hope. Uh, mm. Continue to attack slavery and uh, racism. Hmm. Uh, and therefore having to attack enlightenment theory. And that's doubly weird as a mason that says that. <laughs> um, but the idea that... Uh, the, the Pope and uh, the Emperor are two branches of divine will. And I, I reference her a lot, but Karen Armstrong still fields, she's an amazing author, uh, Fields of Blood, specifically in the, I believe it's the intro that talks about it, but Fields of Blood, uh, she's an ex-nun who biographies religious figures. And um, Fields of Blood is about com uh, uh, religious wars, justification, mm -hmm. especially in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. And in addition to her really going after the American use of the term religion and saying it does not mean it is one of the hardest words to translate. Right. But she talks directly about how there is no way when people talk about the separation of church and state, um, she's like, you have changed what religion is because religion has always existed to justify the state. Mm -hmm. Religion itself. We're not talking about household deity relationships and things like that. Right. But the concept of organized religion exists to justify the state's politics. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the Hierophant, in some ways, is subservient to the emperor because he is there to justify the emperor's decisions and say that this is in league with God's will. Right. Or at least advise the emperor on those things. Yeah. So there, there is, uh, they are, they're in, in <laughs> the rats are doing weird things. Um, they're watching us. Uh, I have pet rats. It's not that there's just random New York rats looking in through the windows, but um, they're, they are very curious as to what we are talking about. <laughs> Um, all four heads are staring. Uh, but the idea that they are two hands in many ways of, of God on earth. And and mm. this is, um, I don't want to go into this, which one's the sinister and which one's the dexter. <laughs> but uh, religious thought is always intrinsically tied to politics. To take politics out of religion does not make sense. Mm. That if it's just about your spiritual high, this individualism is a modern concept itself. Right. And it's very easy to post, to go back and put it upon other concepts, but to to understand that religion is a tool of the state, and that the state is an outgrowth of the religious expression in that way. Very true, and you know, like how do you take in God we trust off of a coin? You can take it off. It doesn't mean that the prevailing paradigm that we are all working in is a Judeo-Christian Enlightenment model mm. that is built upon using resources only to our advantage, and having a moral superior attitude towards. <laughs> everything no, saying sure. that that we are that we are doing right because we are more in line with what but that is a natural evolution of anybody's politics of like you think you're doing right if you're trying not to be an asshole you think you're doing the right thing so I, it's not to excuse it but to explore that like I, mean, I think I was eight or nine when I had a real hard time with the fact that I realized that everybody else thinks they're right <laughs> that they weren't doing it just to piss me off yeah, yeah, yeah. when they were having an argument mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, like it's a hard day yeah. um but I think it's like we all come across that in our own ways of like, oh, my God, that person, they're not just doing it to argue and be like right. contrary. Like they actually are doing what they think is best. It's that extra limb of theory of mind. Right. Uh. So you can you can acknowledge that on, on, on the crudest level that the uh, the newscaster in the TV can't see you 
and, and then you start, you know... Unless my grandfather is talking to you, and then he says they can. Oh, right, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, I uh, bow to the superior wisdom of your elders, yeah. as soon as we have the Hierophant before us. Yes. Uh, but the, yeah, the, the, you know, theory of mind later developing that you, you, you acknowledge that other things have consciousness, and then eventually you have to acknowledge that that consciousness is, you know, uh, is on some level convincing itself that it's right. Uh, when it when it does things, mm. an extra layer that maybe doesn't kick in till far later for some <laughs> people. Mm. So, is there an equivalent to the hierophant in other cantabantic traditions that you are familiar with? Leading question, good sir. <laughs> uh, yes. Cool. All right. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think. Well, I think even the exploration of what the Hierophant is and how to make it relevant to modern times is it's been explored by many tarot makers. So, mm. um, the what's the round one? Is it Mother Piece? The round one? There's a round card tarot. The, the Mother Piece tarot, I'm pretty what, sure. Like, so people don't cut themselves on the hard edges? No, to make it feminine. Oh. It's it's a feminist take oh, on, nice. on the tarot. Uh, I believe I believe the Hierophant is the teacher of wisdom. Mm. So we're not just going for like the, the strong arm of God, <laughs> which... I, you know, if we're talking about which hand it is, it is interesting to consider that he's using his right hand to point up to divinity and he's holding the staff in his left hand, mm -hmm. which um, contrasted to different renderings of the emperor might be interesting to consider. Mm. Um, and certainly I think about this all the time of, of in, in Kimanda of the division of Eshomolu dividing into Menoichi and Kaveda mm -hmm. of, of whose hand is which. And mm -hmm. that is that is a set thing. Yeah. That the right hand is is one of them is Kaveda and the left hand is Menoichi and like huh. what, what that is. And... Uh, the associations with those things, uh, physical remains versus the darkness of death. Right. Um, that the hierophant himself, uh, as far as authority and what that is, is quite interesting. I like the way that um, what was the what did I read when we were doing the, the thing on it that it's the ancestor in like uh, is it the wildwood? Uh huh. Right, and it made that made me think of like the um, oh what was it. Uh, that quote about tradition is the way that the dead vote. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Right? So, that yeah. Sounds like something your wife would say. It does, doesn't it? Or at least quote. <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah, I, I like that concept that that, that neatly um, gives the, hopefully gives some of the value of, of tradition itself as a, a thing of um, genuine veneration and hopefully some, some love for, for that which precedes us. Mm -hmm. And is, you know, um, and has and has given us a foundation to build from, and uh, that we uh, preserve by one day ourselves hopefully becoming good ancestors, and mm -hmm. that that's um, I like for a number of reasons in terms of training us to think in in longer term than our than our own lifetimes. Yeah, I find the concept of collective ancestry versus ancestor is also interesting too. That um, tradition is the way the ancestors vote, but like collectively. Mm. That there could have been individual ancestors who abhorred that specific thing, oh, yeah. but they're they're kind of drowned out. They get one vote. Mm. Um, it's kind of like the discussion around uh, Ire and Ibi or Ire and Osogbo that like there's one Ire who has it manifests in different types, but there's a whole army of bad things mm. out there. And and so not just that uh, the bad things are more uh, are better organized. Yeah, it's just which this. Is, which is that 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 one story about how uh, Ire and Osogbo have to give uh, offerings. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, because whoever's stronger has always done better offerings in the, of in course, the previous world. Of course, because they've listened to the diviner. Yes, exactly. Which is ultimately where the the, the source of <laughs> wisdom and teaching and tradition are emerging from. Says the diviner. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the organization of those things is, is is they've done their both, you know. But it's also right. there is this this understanding of. Um, uh, how does how do the Ajogun, the the forces of of the left come into the world they are born with the first knife thrust of Obatala into the world you cannot the the violence can be channeled but it is still violence mm. so we, we talked about this recently but uh, amongst ourselves but just the the idea that the Orisha in many ways are are um, they each have a counterpart on the Ajogun side or or are multiply tied to several of the of those uh, of the the Osogbo or Ibi depending on what you want to call them um, 
but the the idea that they are you know ogun is the force of violence um but we can direct that violence and be constructive with it and make metal things and make towers and structures and impose hierarchy and order upon that violence and break blocks in order to use those materials to build something yes so that the, the destruction becomes holy destruction mm. um that there you know the the, the the triplicity that is talked about right of holy creation holy destruction holy resolution that mm. there there's a thesis and antithesis and, and yeah, thoroughly dialectic and, yeah, yeah that it has to go to synthesis at some point mm-hmm. um and and the relationship there is is built upon the co-creation of the world with humans mm. and their choices and that you know the orisha have lived as humans to understand this as well mm. that 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 the divinity is applied heavily because of um, each human is carrying the spark of the creator um, in some way. And this is this is, sounds wonderfully Judeo-Christian in that way, but it is not limited to that, that humans have divine, divinity within them. And if you want to go to a non-God place, um, we're talking about consciousness, we're talking about w- the ideas that arise ex nihilo, mm. that... that, that, that it's not just deus ex machina, it's man ex machina. Like, it is that, that there is not necessarily to say that, you know, God doesn't exist in the way that we thought he did as a child, or she did, or it did, or they did, or they did, or whatever uh, God's preferred pronoun is. Um, that our ideas of what that do can, can evolve, they can agglutinate, they can change. Um, and sometimes I think we all get hung up on the semantics of that because uh, most arguments that I get into with people and I don't mean in like a, I'm right but I, I use the philosophical arguments are fun they are good um, you know uh, the the unification the synthesis all these different things um, one plus one equals one mm. um, after a point mm. um, the one versus one is a whole another thing leads um, to a, a bigger one yeah but not in the counting so can we can we dialectic those those three steps can we have Charlie Marx as uh, as a hierophant. <laughs> I, I sure. <laughs> I mean, you can, well, who is your hierophant? Right. You know, what was I saying last night? Of uh, what kind of god are you mm. when you when you animate the text of your of your reading? Mm. But like, uh, what kind of hierophant are you? Mm. This is an interesting com- thing with any of the cards, right? That these are anthropomorphized versions of concepts. Even the star is anthropomorphized in front of you. The sun and the moon have human figures with them, even though if, even though the sun and the moon are historically more, we can see them, so they're kind of anthropomorphized just by being a disc. Um, oh yeah, that's a great take on the moon as well, right? You're, you're both the crustacean coming up from the the, water, the primal waters and the barking dogs. Well, certainly in the sense of uh, and the, moon the devil of associations, right. that the yeah. material world, we, we have a, a, a chain that links us, maybe not the great chain, but to understand that that the moon is the crustacean and the moon is the baying of dogs and the right. moon is the dark night and your nightmare. Mm-hmm. It That is the lunar energy. That is the idea that is emanating from the mind of God as symbolized or embedded in the sphere of the moon, right. but equally so a lunar herb mm-hmm. or a lunar occurrence. Right. Um, and, and, and this way of classifying experience, the phenomenology and the... That yeah. is interesting. The, the occult virtue is not just uh, a property that a thing owns. It's not just uh, uh, an embedded bit of uh, that essentialness of it, but about its instantiation in a web of interrelations. If the color black is all things that we've seen as black, then moon is the con- thing of all things that are of the moon, mm. um, not just the physical body. Mm-hmm. That we limit ourselves to think of it as the planet itself. The planet is tied to a larger concept mm. um, or part of a concept. Let's say if you take away the value judgment of larger, mm-hmm. the moon is the moon and the lunar expression, those rays that emanate are tying all of those things together um, mm. is is far more interesting. It works along the way that, that Ashe has talked about or, or Forza has talked about that, you know, the, the priestess of Yamaya that was... The thing of we, we don't worship Yamaya, we do Yamaya. Mopping the floor is is making Yamaya. Right. You know that any interaction with water is, is and our bodies being what they are is is Yamaya. Um, uh, and uh, this is a a wonderful thing that the moon is not. The moon is the crustaceans, hmm. you know, and that you know yes we 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 put the hierophant because it's a pope, and and he is the authority of God, and we're already referring to something bigger than him. It's authority that we're talking about, yeah. and his, the the seat of authority. Um, but by the time we get up to those other luminary ones, 
of the world and the sun and the moon and the star, yeah. they're still anthropomorphized. Is the star the star above her head that's predominant? Is it the constellation of stars? Is it the fact that she is by the water going through this experience of pouring something? Um, hmm. You know, like all those things, the reflection upon the water of the stars. Um, so the Hierophant equally has to be, the Hierophant can't be the Hierophant without a congregation to lead. So of course those two bald heads have to be there. <laughs> It's not just the symbol of authority, or else it means that it's you. The funny thing about bald heads is that you realize you're facing him too. They've drawn the audience that's in front of you, right. which always means there's still a hierarchy in front of you that's closer to the hierophant mm -hmm. in these lovely little ways of thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, and you're also totally into your, your sociology that religion is what happens when people come together. Uh, if you want to relinking themselves voluntarily right right voluntary right. servitude relegare it's interesting we end up talking about the moon in terms of uh, having its exaltation in Taurus which is the uh, zodiacal sign often attributed to the Hierophant as well uh, so the notion of the fixed earth of the, the church the reason I said papal bullshit <laughs> <laughs> papal bullshit um, and the papal bull uh, but yes uh, this is the actually the only way I remember that association <laughs> is papal bull uh <laughs> And the Taurus thing of I have the dominion mm -hmm. of, of what that is of <laughs> possessions mm -hmm. and the church actually being about land mm -hmm. and substituting and, and crossing the hands to say no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, so we've done Hierophant, we've done Peter and Paul, we've done Honorius. Hey, we're you know chatting like always. Uh, rein it in. Uh, I'm gonna throw out, uh, not throw out, but I'm gonna uh, suggest. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go towards Sapphire because I know that there are some associations that are distinctly papalistic or at least uh, throne of god -istic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So... Ah! Gravity. Yes. So resorting again to uh, Lakuta's wonderful work, um, we get... Oh, we get so many. So... Uh, gosh, where are we? Um, so it's a likely or it's often phrased as a, a stone of the breastplate of Aaron for a start so it's one of the big 12 um, which is already a confusing thing uh, to point out in terms of what was being referred to at that point or what wasn't uh, until the 13th century um, the name Sapphirus uh, probably refers to lapis lazuli um, and specifically the stuff that comes from Libya and uh, I think Turkey um, yeah yeah and, and Turkey I'm looking at my notes uh, the um, what do we got? So it's uh, yeah, it's a it's regarded as a symbol of purity and a bull promulgated by Innocent the Third, who's Pope from eleven ninety eight to twelve sixteen, commanded cardinals and bishops to wear a ring adorned with this gem on their right hand, which is the one used to give blessings. Hmm. So you've got that. There's uh, this stuff about the uh, the tablet of law given to Moses on Mount Sinai being made of sapphire. There's talk of the seal of Solomon being constructed from from sapphire which if we're using modern sapphire having just asked uh, a, a friend of mine who's a, who's a jeweler said that that's 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 tough work <laughs> it's the second well, so it's, the, it's the second toughest stone yeah. after diamond yeah i guess the third story it's the third hardest mineral in general like that's a but we're talking about triplicities is interesting that it is mm -hmm. the third hardest stone um third hardest mineral excuse me but yeah well, if we talk about the, the throne of God and the, the adamantine qualities of like... Yeah, Ezekiel one twenty six and Isaiah 54.11 um, uh, prophets state that God's throne is made of sapphire. Yeah. So this this purity is interesting because when you get the uh, looking at the, 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 the Peterborough lapidary, if you, you know, if we're going to fast forward to 15th, probably 15th century England, it's a diviner's stone. It's a stone of uh, putting under your tongue and speaking uh, purely. Hmm. Speaking accurately. Interesting. Um, you know the, the the side of it of like what is sapphire just keeps on changing too, like sapphires and the, the you know blue corundum and all these other things as it evolves. Um, but uh, uh, I believe uh, sapphire is the the sixty five year stone. Um, oh yeah. When you when you hit sixty five and something. Oh cool. Uh, right. That's the sapphire anniversary. Nice. Um, but also that sapphire is the bluish. So the throne of God being blue, right. as opposed to diamond being clear. Mm. Uh, the sky, we're emphasizing a, something, some type of uh, sky reference there. I would assume it has to be part of that, in addition to blue being the color of, the, of virginity and purity um, until white replaced it. Mm. <laughs> um, but uh, the, you know, the, the something blue in the marriage vows are because the, they were dressed in blue, um, like the Virgin Mary. Right. Everything goes back to the, the Mary with the cherry. 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and it is the the birthstone of September. Oh yeah. That's uh, yeah. I was talking again. The the, uh, the the my my jeweler friend, our jeweler friend Justin, uh, was um, ranting about. He's my friend. I've seen him like, twice now. Yay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's a nice guy. He is. Uh, oh, and he was um, confirming what I've always been confused about in terms of where do these birthstones come from? Oh, uh, yeah, which is super recent and a bunch of people trying to sell a bunch of rocks sell a bunch of rocks <laughs> and like loosely tied to astrological right. sign mm-hmm. so like bloodstone being aries and aries starts in march bloodstone becomes march mm-hmm. and you're like but aries is mostly in april <laughs> um says the aries who's like diamond is really expensive <laughs> um but then talking about diamond as taurus is like this whole other thing of like wait it's not really my sign mm. rude rude <laughs> um eh, also uh uh Proposing that sapphire comes from a relationship to the word uh, Saturn. Oh. That, that there is a linguistic, not the word Saturn, but the linguistic thing of in Sanskrit of being dear to Saturn mm-hmm. and sapphires coming ultimately from a, a similar rude word etymologically. That's um, really interesting because you get um, lapis, again, um, associated with, uh, with, with Saturn, which uh, in, 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 in some older texts and some early modern texts that seem to be drawing on that, where it's it seems very disjunct from this idea of like obviously the the black stones but also the dusty ones the dull ones mm-hmm. the dark gray ones the ones that that look uh, horrible and uh, or, or, or poor or uh, base in some form right and then also lapis lazuli uh, which doesn't <laughs> well interestingly like when, when when we talk about lapis lazuli which is a softer stone mm. the exclusiveness of lapis lazuli being the trade being so controlled and lapis lazuli occurring pretty much in one part of the world majority of it coming from afghanistan um and and some other countries that are nearby that at one point when it becomes too dangerous and the crusades are on lapis needs to, it drives lapis's value up but a substitute stone must start coming through right so you get cheaper versions of that or the egyptians creation of egyptian blue mm-hmm. which was much earlier obviously mm. but the idea that they didn't want to necessarily have to trade with people from so far away to get this vibrant blue mm. but that lapis is the source of that cerulean blue so much in art and it's the, the i've been interested in the trade relationships with with europe and it's how it the effects on magic might be interesting to study i don't feel like it's been talked about a lot mm. but the, the the association with gold and what that is that the majority of gold in the middle ages comes from the kingdom of mali Hmm. And like that made him the the, the king of Mali like the one of, considered to be the most richest the rich the most richest mm-hmm. the the richest person in all of world no history. One's richest. No, no one's richest than him, um, Richester, uh, the Earl of Richester. Um, <laughs> so the why is there so much pouring into this? Why is there gold in the new? How is the gold in the new world? Mm-hmm. Is not just because of the finding of some gold in the new world, but it was the hope that we could get away from having to trade with Mali oh, for their gold. Snap. That that it is about controlling, and I can go dominate that land, and now we will be the source of gold yeah. in Europe. And that side of it, the Gundrums and steel side of the exploration yeah. and the and the sources, is very interesting to me. The, it's the economic argument for why Mary's in blue, right? That it was uh, it was it was fabulously expensive, and so it's this offering to her. It's the yeah the economic argument as opposed to like sky, uh, a chosen bride of the sky god right. of 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 right. blue makes or sense. Or ascending. Yes. Mm. Um, uh, so last seen wearing blue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, last seen wearing flesh. <laughs> uh, but you, you get that with other things called Mary's robe as well, like uh, rosemary. Mm-hmm. Uh, Has blue flowers. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is also because she later cloak upon the plant. Yes. I mean, we know that this is a historical truth. Al. Exactly. So, uh, as they were fleeing Egypt, don't yeah. mess with my Mary <laughs> plants. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Anything more about Sapphire you wish to, if we're talking about exploring Marie and stuff, apparently according to Greek traditions, um, and, and Lakuto here is, is wonderful at like talking about them but then he just lists all the sources at the end and you have to work out where he got the different bits from in these records but uh, he, he attributes it to the patronage of Aphrodite and thus it's also said to bestow graciousness and victory at assemblies uh, especially when it's uh, engraven 
uh, when Aphrodite's image is engraven. And certainly the Venusian connections to Taurus, and Taurus being the Hierophant. Like, look, mm -hmm. we picked another one. Boom! Ah, oh, done. I think it's like justifying our, our weird Sesame Street <laughs> is really what we're doing. Um, it's, 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 it's a fun game, then. In my head, sapphires are a lot like the, um, the substitute diamond. Um, and they're so distinctly blue, even though there's other stones, they come in other colors, but it's the blue ones. Mm. Um, and that association of blue with, with purity and clarity is interesting. And I think the programming of, you know, we see water is blue and the sky is blue and, and yeah. these other things. And that's um, interesting in terms of the more we have access to synthetic things that can look like the things, the more we end up coming back to defining gems, at least we, I don't know, uh, the, the, the more non-gemologists or geologists, we seem to, you know, emerald is the green one, uh -huh. which is, I guess, not, not that new either, right? Uh, Smaragdos, etc. So, I don't know. I, I think colour is uh, very useful, not just morphologically, <coughs> but also as, you know, that again, an instantiation of something, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to a marker that it belongs to something. I know we've talked about this before, so, but the idea that uh, a lot of times in, in, in modern magic that we hold on to the thought that it's just some undiscovered chemical structure of the thing that allows magic to work. We're trying to explain right. magical philosophy and theory mm -hmm. by th explaining it away through scientific theory mm -hmm. as we know it. And this is, um, uh, I, I don't think it's fruitful in the end. I think it actually diverts us from accepting magic, those of us that are firm believers in that there is this thing it explains itself it does not need um uh, to be wrestled with in the scientific way or 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 at least using bad science or pseudoscience to justify it actually shuts things down rather than it becomes a, a reason why so you don't need to ask any further mm -hmm. right it, it's it's you, you've you've filled your cup and there's no more spirit science space to, bruh. right 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 you and, do spirit science all over the place and <laughs> uh and where it goes from there of of you wrapping in bad quantum physics right and like using that to justify everything mm -hmm. um that excusing away magic through saying yeah uh the vibration of the atom does something on a quantum level that we can't explain yet right as opposed to it, that's to me the opposite of a mystery right I, I i like the like you know as a an angry teenager who thoroughly distrusted organized religion the idea of mystery always seemed hand wavy and a way of saying this is as far as you get to think about this thing and beyond this thing just shut up and, mm -hmm. and don't question us the conflation of secret with mystery right mystery I, as i think about it now is a is more like a renewable resource something that you can keep returning to mm -hmm. and will keep uh, nourishing and keep providing you with new things to ponder and integrate and process in modern parlance it would be a guiding question a mm. question that cannot be answered once a question right. that is that is you are brought back to and ask your question to guide a, a project or a conversation forward yeah and this is this is approaching what mystery is that secrets can be revealed through fact or ex exposition mm -hmm. mysteries can be hinted at through the same mm. but not revealed right and the, the revealing the mysteries isn't actually possible mm. um uh, that why do you love your partner? Why do you love your wife, your husband, those things? And like, there's tangible examples, but that is a, m pointing at a mystery as the mystery of love or the mystery of partnership or the right. mystery of commitment, that, that love itself is not a, a human universal and therefore is a mystery in and of itself right there. Mm -hmm. um, that, that it changes definitions based on what right. someone means. And I someone might say, he made me laugh, and really that's the reason I'm with him. <laughs> uh, someone say, he's got a, you know, I won't go there. Uh, that, she, <laughs> that, that she's got beautiful eyes, and, and that's, you know, that's really the most important. That's the thing that stands out for you right now. Mm. But it's pointing at something else. It's the... The, <laughs> it's the hand of the hierophant pointing up to a god we can't see and saying I'm his authority mm -hmm. uh, which is so interesting uh, I don't mean that to denigrate love or partnership or anything like that I just mean it's so interesting that we use it as guideposts it is the uh, right. and the, the Peter that we meet right and the act is it, it, and each time we return to that crossroads that's the that's the answer we give right yeah. but that this is a guiding question that can provide a number of answers uh, innumerable answers maybe you know, who, whose cups have not yet been numbered, right? <laughs>
uh, yeah, that that makes that makes a, a lot more sense to me. And saying you know, it, oh, it's all just particles uh, is bad epistemology and kind of shuts down the the initiatory uh, results or um, potential for, of, 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 of engaging with mystery. Well, it's the labeling and classification as uh, the trump card that many people have, right? You know, you, you can label your issue, you can label this thing, and suddenly, because you have power of the name, hmm. you don't actually have to deal with it. Right. That's, that's not where we stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the mystery is, because the mystery has a name, Oh, she's in love with him, or he's in love with her, or he's in love with him, or whatever it is. Um, I think I was just trying to go through gender gender polarities there. Um, uh, they're in love with them. Uh, it makes it much easier. Uh, is a way of explaining it and saying, "Oh, he's in love. That's why he's acting like that." Mm -hmm. And you're like, "Yes, but he's acting like an asshole." <laughs> so that... yeah, the issue is also not what caused the thing, but what to do about yes uh, the, the 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 modern the conundrum of uh, what is it, Oprah theory, right? Of like. I have these problems in life because my mother didn't didn't give me the t I didn't get the tools from from a, an upbringing because of something you know happening, mm -hmm. um, and explaining why you are limited as opposed to you have limited resources but you still want to achieve the same goals. So it's the mm -hmm. again the gun journals and steals of things. Yes, some people do have a greater resource or agency. The discussion of um, uh, uh, of privilege. As, and comparing it any, in, in whatever the privilege, whether it's racial privilege or economic privilege or, or all these other things often tied and, right. and linked to yeah, each yeah. other, obviously. But the idea that if you compare it to a video game, that there's easy, medium, and hard, and you still must accomplish the tasks of a game. So some people start on a hard level with regards to some things. Yeah. With language acquisition, because their brain is not, they haven't been exposed to languages as a child, so it's harder for them to learn languages. Right. As so opposed to someone who benefited from being around multiple languages as a child, yeah. has them probably on the medium or the easy side of language acquisition. Yeah. And this is just the, the starting level does not mean that the goals do not need to be accomplished, but we can't also throw out the possibility that you have multiple levels going on of easy, medium, and hard for each of your things that you're pursuing in life. Mm -hmm. And to say that, oh, everybody has the access to the same things. They do, but are they on easy, medium, or hard? Right. And, and the difference between equal opportunity and equal access. Yes. Equality versus equity. Right. And those discussions around those things. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Before we turn it into another seven-hour episode, that's what happens when we don't talk as much. Mm. Um, uh, let's, are you okay to move on to Basil, as you say it, Basil, as I say it, sure. or Albaca, as my grandmother says it? Mm. Um, so, okay, I will let you. I know you have done your research. Oh, well, uh, I took a picture of some herbals. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of the same as research, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, okay, so basil is uh, tied to it's it's mint family. I mean, like that's important to acknowledge right there. So it needs a lot of water and a lot of sun to do its magic. Mm -hmm. um, basil is the quintessential like thing we think of with Italian food and and a lot of uh, Southeast Asian food. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, dried basil is used heavily and in, in available in stores. Uh, living basil, uh, I think the my friends uh, over the past 20 years that always say like, oh, I have kitchen herbs. And you're like, I want to use a lot more basil than I can grow. Like it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't, it seems to, to shun uh, quick growth. It wilts quickly um, if it doesn't get its water. Uh, Oxymum basilicum uh, uh, is, is basil uh, associated uh, with, and there are many basils. Of course, there's holy basil, anise basil, cinnamon basil. Uh, I believe there's even an opal basil. Um, uh, purple basil you see a lot on for sale here african blue um mm -hmm. which is of of interest for uh many in in gimanda um thai cooking uses a good couple kinds that usually all get called thai basil right? yeah. basil. um and and i think it's also interesting because we're, we're talking about most of these are oxymum basilicum some of them are ox other oxymums uh, botanically i think it's just important always that i i, I see a trend sometimes in in magic to forget that the first name in a plant name is the family name it's like chinese names it's asian naming patterns mm -hmm. that to we we have to remember that the second word 
of a plant name of a of a binomial nomenclature. Mm-hmm. That is the actual thing we're talking about. The mm-hmm. first one is um, the 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 genus specifically, right. um, not the family name, because that's actually a technical term. Mm-hmm. But I refer to it as the family name of a human, the surname. Uh, the surname. Yeah, yeah. So the surname comes first. So you know this is Cummins Al. And mm-hmm. that, you know, it, it's it's important to remember that in magic because sometimes I see a lot of bad botany. Uh, kings play chess only for group sex is the um, the mem- mnemonic of, oh, uh, for of it. Genuses. Kings, yeah, kingdom, play, phylum, uh, chess, class, only, order, for, family, group, genus, sex, species. Mm. Um, thank you, Mr. Cannon, high school biology. <laughs> Always remembered that. So uh, basil itself, uh, sweet basil, holy basil, lemon basil, Thai basil, whatever you want to call it, there is there's a, a certain smell that that comes across in it, and there there definitely is different balances of our different balances that, that make basil smell right. more towards the citrus side or more towards the chocolate side or more towards the the Thai side, um, which is a weird reference. Uh, you also get uh, the different oxymums like um, holy basil which is uh, I don't believe is technically an oxymum basilicum um, is a different oxymum um, but I could be completely making that up uh, but the the basil in the Greek is referring to the royal or kingly right Basilius and, Basilius and, mm-hmm. and this is an important thing uh, yes the uh, holy basil is another type of oxymum oxymum sanctum uh, teniflorum uh, so the the idea that when we talk about basil, we are talking about a genus and a species, both. Hmm. Um, and that Tulsi or holy basil uh, is is another type of oxymum, but still has lore that we then take for our own basil. And uh, hmm. there's the the different types of like uh, citral, which is like from lemon basil, and uh, is is the flavored flavor profile you're going through. It's 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 that way of adding citrus, like lemongrass, right. to uh, the the cuisine. Hmm. Which um, also, uh, I am told, similar to like um, the use of sage in England uh, and in Western Europe, hmm. which was to hide the smell of meat that was just turning. Right. So you, it wasn't going to kill you if you ate it. Mm-hmm. But it, the other side of it is that when you use an aromatic herb like sage, like basil, the carminatives in it, uh, the carminative action, excuse me, uh, lessens gas and lessens. Um, problems it, it it the flatulence yeah so well yeah, yeah. it lessens just the issues with um the gases that are escaping rotting meat are more mm. easily digestible because you're adding an herb with a strong flavor profile mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it's an interesting thing of like not only does it cover the smell which is also perhaps indicative of what the action of the herb is in the body as right. well so it's not even necessarily um doctrine of signatures so much as like well the, the smell action actually is is indicative of what's going yeah, to happen yeah. inside your body when you go into the digestion action. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, that was partially my stall to see if you had enough time to look at your notes. Oh, of course, yeah. Um, so take it away, Basil. Well, generally, if we're talking <laughs> astrologically attributed to Mars, which uh, I think is already interesting in terms of a kingship, but not a kingship of the sun or even of, of Jupiter or even of a greater malefic, but uh, a kingship of, of action, of doing a kingship informed by protecting and uh, specifically also very often attributed to not the 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 vibrant uh, active uh, positive diurnal side of mars but to scorpio and the the nocturnal and and mistrustful uh side the, the the venomous one now there are all sorts of bits of lore around uh, scorpions generating from basil. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've 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 read that if you took certain kinds of basil that I think needed to be grown in horse dung, and you rubbed it between <laughs> two stones, that that would eventually that pulp, if you just kept rubbing it, uh, would eventually produce scorpions. There's definitely accounts of people smelling it and growing scorpions in their brain. Culpepper <clears throat> definitely yeah, talks yeah. about that. Uh, but that the 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 Greeks supposedly also feared that uh, it would grow scorpions in the uh, under it. Mm. Um, one of the fascinating points of that scorpionic thing is that supposedly, according to one herbal I read, the Romans regarded it as a symbol of hatred, uh, but the Italians moved to it being a symbol of love and or lust. 
uh, which feels a lot more Scorpionic. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly, uh, you know, Scorpio, the, the, the astrological sign, for sure. Um, and the rulership by Mars is interesting there, too. The, the, the lore all moving there. Because uh, for those that are in the modern astrological paradigm, that Scorpio is traditionally ruled by Mars on a seven-planet system. Mm -hmm. um, the watery Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Mars underwater, uh, rusting away. The other side of... If you, you mentioned the Greek thing with, with scorpions and these things. It's interesting because that's what the Greek Orthodox used to sprinkle holy water. Mm. So the 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 aspergillum that is often talked about, I, I it's always interesting to consider that in, in, in a Catholic country that using Orthodox means for, for doing some of your things is kind of subversive. Um, uh, but certainly interesting thought of basil being used as the aspergillum. Well, it's uh, also because it's owned by... Uh, Scorpio, or because it's an instantiation of Scorpio's power in the world, uh, it's also used against venom and against poisonous things. So, I mean, as a as an asperger, like a... and certainly with it being royal and kingly, the name itself, mm -hmm. um, Basilica, right. like we we think of what this is of just just the the seat of power mm -hmm. um, over the cathedra of Peter's chair or whoever's chair, the the pontiff's chair you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but that feels like a little inoculation, right? Get a little bit of of, of venomous uh, virtue right? and certainly the combination of like oregano which has a similar profile but ba basil has a sting mm. to it the, the flavor it literally has a, a sting to it compared to some of the flatter uh of the sweets of marjoram or the other members of the the uh the main family mm. um and and going through that well that's interesting in oroscanos being the the joy of the mountain so mm -hmm. this airiness of of uh of exaltation Right, as opposed to the the sting of the seat of power. Mm. That's that's a nice comparison. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about uh, something I read on Wikipedia because mm -hmm. you're more knowledgeable in this. Uh, but <laughs> being placed in the not in Wikipedia in in the subject I'm going to talk. <laughs> you're a Wikipedia king. <laughs> um, but this lovely thing of in Europe, basil is placed in the hands of the dead to ensure a safe journey. Any knowledge as to what the what they're referencing? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, uh, that just screwed up that little thing. That's cool. I, I mean, mean, it's it's a lovely sound, but I, I, again, that would also highlight some uses of basil outside of basil. Yeah. Good grief. Oh, it's, oh I it's, did it. No. I did it. My father is going to be furious. Um, oh, he can... He's fu well, like, this is the first thing he's going to be furious about. <laughs> I say my father will hear of this not as a threat. <laughs> as a... Uh, your father has put a bug in my house without even, even being here, I'm sure. <laughs> um, really? In the hands of whom? Mm. And supposedly the quote comes from... Uh, Amy Felder's savory sweets from ingredients to planted desserts. I actually gave a thing because I can look at Wikipedia and say what it is. Hmm. I just don't know. Amy, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> Knock <Ooh>. once. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've just become the Fox sisters. Um, uh, so, Amy, uh, if you can tell us which, which Europe you're referring to and which basil you're referring to mm. and indeed uh if you want to qualify dead or safe or journey as well feel free but uh right. just uh curios curiosity of i'm not familiar with that exact tradition no. um so i would love to know more about uh wh what it is because i'm not familiar with it it make and you're not familiar with it perhaps it's central northern or eastern europe because our specialty seems to be more western yeah. um but uh we shall see um, certainly I could see the parallels of, uh, if you are holding basil in your hand and you're an Eastern Orthodox upbringing that basil was used to, to asperse you with holy water and then right. carrying that memory into the afterlife mm -hmm. is I've been baptized, right. but I just made that up. That's a supposition. So I don't want anybody to quote me as like, yes, that's sure. why they put basil in the hand. But that would be my first justification. Mm -hmm. And then it's an aromatic and... You yes, know, but much more familiar with rosemary, as we've talked about, on, yes. uh, in, with the dead on top of the uh, the dead on top of the casket. Uh, carry, you know, put sprigs on the the hats or held by the the people in procession to or from the the churchyard. Uh, no, that would be a lovely point of transition to talking about basil in uh, other um, less uh, explicitly European contexts. Yeah, and the the basil use in in in, in 
uh, herbal lore in Umbanda Kimbanda of it being a, a Kulunga herb. It's an aromatic, so it must be associated with the cemetery in some way, but that it is a, a broader thing than, like, rosemary has this very spike-like quality. Mm -hmm. Basil has this to the taste, but that itself, that um, uh, Kulunga Crusado in general, but in general, the, the dead are like these aromatic herbs. Mm -hmm. um, and which goes into the whole classification of aromatic herbs in general in, in, in Latin America of um, someday the herb will be bibapuru that we talk about. <laughs> um, but uh, camphoritic smells and basil can go toward the camphoritic mm. um, and, and, and what that is of the opening up of the passages that allows the air to escape the body more and, and things right. like that. Right, and to, and to free from boundaries, right? The, the camphorous things i'm more familiar with them having a a, a way of uh, destroying something they're they're irascible right destroying something that's getting in the way that you're burning something away and so that notion so ironically of, it's the camper trees that are dying in the california drought in my hometown oh. but uh sorry burning away i was nah. like oh the drought okay so removal of obstacles removal of of and even removal of obstacles in a passage that it expands that it vasodilates the, the passages mm -hmm. these these smells is very interesting um, As someone who has created an oil of a basilisk, mm -hmm. would you care to, to comment on uh, basil and, and basilisks? Well, I think the sting is there, the scorpionic reference is there, but it's also the nobility. So it's the king of serpents. Mm -hmm. And I think this is obviously this is the basilicus coming mm -hmm. in there um, and, and basilisk in itself that if we're going to talk about uh, scorpions, I, you know, I'm inspired by your wife's research into Tarantismo of... of the, the three main venomous creatures of the spider, the serpent, and the scorpion yeah. that um, the, the, the dead can possibly come to us in this form to kind of align us with a spirit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the, the basilisk uh, is believed by many to be referencing the king cobra and uh, to be a reference to that lovely bestiaric influence of, of <laughs> telephone game. Mm -hmm. Of making it more sensational because my bestiary has got to sell better than owls. Right, right, right. Um, but uh, but th there's there's a possibility for more. But the 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 serpent in that way, or that the manticore is the tiger mm. and things like that. Also, I don't want to use the what we talked about earlier, the scientific explanation behind these things. Right. But it is important to explore it. Certainly, the king of serpents, mm -hmm. the king cobra, is a thing, mm. and uh, the spitting venom, and what that is. But the basilisk itself uh, being a combination of of. Uh, and the cockatrice and the lores being overlapped. Right, of, and I was thinking about that about petrifying stairs. Yeah, mm. and the the, the being and there there are many quote unquote um, almost scripture like references in the sense of um, a basilisk is only this one thing and a cockatrice is only this one thing. But that's not how history or folklore work. No. Um, so you see references to basilisk being tied to. Uh, Chicken egg raised by a toad, toad egg raised by a chicken, <laughs> um, fraught because toads are hatred as yep. it is, and the 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 chicken, the rooster itself, and its relationship to Saint Peter and the betrayal, mm. and the the spitting on Christ in that way, and the 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 kind of evolution that happens there, and the heraldry of of, of the rooster being the loud animal that heralds the sun, even though anybody that's been around roosters will tell you they herald whatever the hell they want all times of the day. Mm -hmm. um, the sun is just a convenient excuse, <laughs> um, but. Basilisk itself, I, I find interesting in the, if you want to talk it to Basil, Basil. <laughs> <laughs> um, it works both ways, doesn't it? Uh, the idea of the cure being in the, in the disease or the disease being related to the cure, at least, mm -hmm. um, that uh, Basilisk can be used to uh, defend property. If one could, if one could tame a Basilisk or have the Basilisk working for you, what does this mean? And how could you use the venom? To craft the anti-venom for yourself, but still be venomous for other people, mm. um, is an interesting thing. So for me, the basilisk is an interesting relationship with venom and and what that is, and yeah. um, certainly uh, the lore of venom and what it is. And some venoms are, are far more potent. And should you get it on the skin, you know, and you have a cut, you it will coagulate your blood. And uh, this interesting side of it, so ah, the sting. So there is something around turning something more solid than it should be. Yeah, it's always made with the petrification there. Mm -hmm. of like, if a certain if a if certain neurotoxins get into you, certain hemotoxins get into you, what are their effects on the body? That the paralysis that comes, the shaking, the the divine sickness of of seizures mm. um, coming, and that your body is now going through a freezing process, and then you die mm. um, very quickly from exposure to certain things. So. Mm. 
also I, I, I like the idea of um, spitting as far as basilisk venom uh, a metaphor for snake strike because snakes return once they've bitten they don't off, they don't always stay in you so they uh, if you're not paying attention you'll feel the sting and you'll see the bite mark but it almost feels like they just spat at you because the snake is back to looking at you like you need to go away from me mm -hmm. um, so it's a very quick thing some do latch on and stay and that's terrifying because how do you deal with that and when I see reptile handlers deal with that very well I'm very amazed um, smacking them down yeah okay um and stop here uh we did not get to all of our topics which is fine strangely we didn't talk geomancy odu or demon at all no no that's that was kind of nice we spent a lot more time f talking about tarot it is than we normally do um so and a dead magician and a dead magician so um let's say that that's a, a good episode and we will hold off on puer for another time mm -hmm. uh the boyishness and Mirim and Sergathy there is great. So um, with that, uh, the, 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 the tolling of the bells for Al to, to return to his faraway Basiliski, Bas Bas Basiliski of, I, I'm trying to say kingdom and be a reference on Basil. I'm failing miserably. <laughs> um, to my basilica. Yeah, go to your basilica of Basil um, far away. My uh, seat of power. Yeah, your your Brooklyn, your Carroll Gardens, with your, <laughs> with your with your Italian food and your lawn shrines and mm -hmm. um, a, a wife. <laughs> uh, go home to your whiff. Uh, but uh, lovely having an episode recorded and yeah. uh, happy feast of Saint Peter and Paul. May uh, I still am fascinated with Peter and the idea of learning to to observe them as they come out the small lies we tell ourselves the small lies we tell others in defense of ego mm. and uh which can catch up with you and compile right. and uh that paul's uh revelation that you can change your course in life if you want to you do not have to just because you've committed to something with fervor does not mean you have to stay with it right um is important and that Sapphire's adamantine qualities and, and substitution qualities of being the next best diamond thing um, <laughs> I, I think is, is worthy of note. And, um, and the strength of uh, a pure uh, effort or intention and uh, uh, yeah, that, that notion of being able to, to speak as true as a clear blue sky. And if you're going to sell a book, blame it on a dead pope. Yep. Always. Um, or at least the current Pope. <laughs> um, and uh, just the questions of authority. Um, mm. If if religion exists to justify politics in this way, and I do invite, go back and look at that book, but um, what do we do to justify our politics? What How are we living our lives to justify our bad decisions and our good decisions? And, and what is our belief structure that supports that? And... I, I think the advantage to magic, especially spirit-based magic, is that we can have things that come and purposely fuck with us and fuck with our ideas of ourselves and that that action and friction and opposition that bullheaded Peter at the crossroads provides new ways to go over and through or around and, and, and subvert or distract ourselves but that stimulation and the flame of that i think is a wonderful pot a potent venom and anti-venom yes mm. and and makes us the, the mirror of magic here truly of using it to 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 become the change that we want you know mm. to to merge pseudo gandhi into this of uh, so many times we fight to create change, but we do not seek to change ourselves. Mm. And, um, you know, there's that always that thing that if we, I do not like the mentality that, uh, it, bad things happen to people who deserve it, mm. but we certainly can examine our role in the bad things in our life and to see maybe how we can change it. And as, as, um, pseudo magicians, pseudo philosophers, pseudo, whatever we are, and I say pseudo only in the sense of it feels hubristic to be like, as magicians, right. as necromancers, no mm -hmm. one necromances better than me. <laughs> um, We're going to raise the dead and make them pay for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> one of the totally titles of my, stolen. One of the titles me. of my talk last night. <laughs>
yeah, um, that a good king should be prepared to shed skin sometimes. Yeah, or or jump skins. Mm. And, you know, there, there is the little bit of the Gastoneta influence of, like, how does a magician become good, a sorcerer be good? They have to move away from everybody and everything they've ever known. Mm. Because the the ties to family, the ties to commitments will hold you back. And we who are working not doing that, we have to confront and face those things, too. The decisions we've made that our social media record or whatever it is does and can hold us back mm. and, and from embracing a change. And, and what a courageous and what an interesting new fire we cultivate to seek to change in spite of that being held back. Mm -hmm. Of how can I sever those things and what is important to me as I move forward. Not what was important to me yesterday or mm -hmm. even five minutes of what is, where is my goal? A fire that will continue to burn underwater. Yes. As it's attempt to be oh, dampened. Crawl. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody ever saw a crawl. <laughs> I feel with like the, no the, one saw with it. With the glaive. With the glaive. Yeah, and yeah. it's bad Star Wars references, but that was yeah. the thing of like, I bring fire to water and they pull fire back out of water. Mm -hmm. And the, the burning pillar of God is, is a big thing of like, what are we following? Mm -hmm. And um, what do we set our goal on? What is the lighthouse that we are following? What is the, the goal? And I think that one of the, in discussing the card qualities and things like that last night or, or two nights ago in dealing with Baraja Española, the absence of order is not necessarily disorder. Mm. That there's a, there's an active sowing of disorder that can happen, mm -hmm. which is different from taking away order, which will probably lead to disorder, or it might lead to someone creating order out of that. Mm. But that sometimes we're so afraid that the absence of the thing that we hold on to will mean that we won't have anything ever like it ever again, uh, whether it's relationship or job or, or magical path or what these mm. things are. So that defense of ego identification with the thing means that we feel physically attacked, means that our enlightenment, slavery, colonial structure mm -hmm. is crumbling. Mm -hmm. And and what comes next? Um, I don't know. First, we have to confront the Peter and Paul in ourselves mm. of the little lies we tell ourselves to defend something that might not be what we actually want. Mm. And when we know it's not what we want, can we convert mm. completely? Um, so I guess that's my wish, um, other than to talk about the seed of peter in the future episode um <laughs> but uh thank you for taking the time to to listen to us um we know you have many options in podcasting listening and we thank you for your time with us um very but, much so yeah uh also thank you al for for your time and uh looking forward to to regularly recording more in the future yeah and absolutely. um so uh, a blessed feast of peter and paul to all who are listening um and may the 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 grace and virtue of this day uh, be carried with the episode into the future for those that are listening posthumously. Oh, God, yeah. have we died? Um, well, the <laughs> saints have. Uh, yeah. They yeah, live yeah, again yeah. on their day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, thank you, Honorius. Thank you, Basil. Thank you, Sapphire. Thank you, um, uh, Peter and Paul and uh, Hierophant. And and we go from there. So uh, with that, uh, say something witty and British for a farewell. Bollocks. Okay, that works. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, and uh, more soon. Take care.